To Sir Philip, with love. By Julia Quinn. Prologue. February 1823. Gloucestershire, England. It was ironic, really, that it had happened on such a sunny day. The first sunny day in, what had it been six straight weeks of gray skies, accompanied by the occasional sprinkling of light snow or rain? Even Philip, who thought himself impervious to the vagaries of the weather, had felt his spirits lighten, his smile widen. He'd gone outside, he'd had to. No one could remain indoors during such a splendid display of sunshine. Especially in the middle of such a gray winter. Even now, more than a month after it had happened, he couldn't quite believe that the sun had had the temerity to tease him so, and how was it that he'd been so blind that he'd not expected it? He'd lived with Marina since the day of their marriage. Eight long years to know the woman. He should have expected it. And in truth. Well, in truth, he had expected it. He just hadn't wanted to admit to the expectation. Perhaps he was just trying to delude himself, protect himself, even. To hide from the obvious, hoping that if he didn't think about it, it would never happen. But it did. And on a sunny day, to boot, God certainly had a sick sense of humor. He looked down at his glass of whiskey, which was, quite inexplicably, empty. He must have drunk the damned thing, and yet he had no memory of doing so. He didn't feel woozy at least not as woozy as he should have been, or even as woozy as he wanted. He stared out the window at the sun, which was slipping low on the horizon. It had been another sunny day today. That probably explained his exceptional melancholy. At least he hoped it did. He wanted an explanation, needed one, for this awful tiredness that seemed to be taking over. Melancholy terrified him. More than anything, more than fire, more than war, more than hell itself. The thought of sinking into sadness, of being like her. Marina had been melancholy. Marina had spent her entire life, or at least the entire life he'd known, melancholy. He couldn't remember the sound of her laughter, and in truth, he wasn't sure that he'd ever known it. It had been a sunny day, and he squeezed his eyes shut, not certain whether the motion was meant to urge the memory or dispel it. It had been a sunny day, and never thought you'd feel the likes of that on your skin again, eh, Sir Philip? Philip Crane turned his face to the sun, closing his eyes as he let the warmth spread over his skin. It's perfect, he murmured. Or it would be, if it weren't so bloody cold. Miles Carter, his secretary, chuckled. It's not as cold as that. The lake hasn't frozen this year. Just a few patchy spots. Reluctantly, Philip turned away from the sun and opened his eyes. It isn't spring, though. If you were wishing for spring, sir, perhaps you should have consulted a calendar. Philip regarded him with a sideways glance. Do I pay you for such impertinence? Indeed. And rather handsomely, too, Philip smiled to himself as both men paused to enjoy the sun for a few moments longer. I thought you didn't mind the gray, Miles said conversationally once they'd resumed their trek to Philip's greenhouse. I don't, Philip said, striding along with the confidence of a natural athlete, but just because I don't mind an overcast sky doesn't mean I don't prefer the sun. He paused, thought for a moment. Be sure to tell Nurse Millsby to take the children outside today. They'll need warm coats, of course, and hats and mittens and the like, but they ought to get a little sun on their faces. They've been cooped up far too long. As have we all, Miles murmured. Philip chuckled. Indeed. He glanced over his shoulder at his greenhouse. He probably ought to take care of his correspondence now, but he had some seeds he needed to sort through, and truly, there was no reason he couldn't conduct his business with Miles in an hour or so. Go on, he said to Miles. Find Nurse Mills by. You and I can deal later. You know you hate the greenhouse, anyway, not this time of year, Miles said. The heat is rather welcome. Philip arched a brow as he inclined his head toward Romney Hall. Are you calling my ancestral home drafty? All ancestral homes are drafty. True enough, Philip said with a grin. He rather liked Miles.
He'd hired him six months earlier to help with the mountains of paperwork and details that seemed to accumulate from the running of his small property. Miles was quite good. Young, but good, and his dry sense of humor was certainly welcome in a house where laughter was never in abundance. The servants would never dare joke with Philip and Marina, well, it went without saying that Marina did not laugh or tease. The children sometimes made Philip laugh, but that was a different sort of humor, and besides, most of the time he did not know what to say to them. He tried, but then he felt too awkward, too big, too strong, if such a thing were possible. And then he just found himself shooing them off, telling them to go back to their nurse. It was easier that way. Go on, then, Philip said, sending Miles off on a task he probably should have done himself. He hadn't seen his children yet today, and he supposed he ought to, but he didn't want to spoil the day by saying something stern, which he inevitably seemed to do. He'd find them while they were off on their nature walk with Nurse Millsby. That would be a good idea. Then he could point out some sort of plant and tell them about it, and everything would remain perfectly simple and benign. Philip entered his greenhouse and shut the door behind him, taking a welcome breath of the moist air. He'd studied botany at Cambridge, taken a first, even, and in truth, he'd probably have taken up an academic life if his older brother had not died at Waterloo, thrusting the second-born Philip into the role of landowner and country gentleman. He supposed it could have been worse. He could have been landowner and city gentleman, after all. At least here, he was able to pursue his botanical pursuits in relative serenity. He bent over his workbench, examining his latest project a strain of peas that he was trying to breed to grow fatter and plumper in the pod. No luck yet, though. This latest batch was not just shriveled but had even turned yellow, which had not been the expected result at all. Philip frowned, then allowed himself a small smile as he moved to the back of the greenhouse to gather his supplies. He never minded too terribly when his experiments did not produce the expected outcome. In his opinion, necessity had never been the mother of invention. Accidents. It was all about accidents. No scientist would admit to it, of course, but most great invention occurred while one was attempting to solve some other problem entirely. He chuckled as he swept the shriveled peas aside. At this rate, he'd cure gout by the end of the year. Back to work back to work. He bent over his seed collection, smoothing them out so that he could examine them all. He needed just the right one for. He looked up and out the freshly washed glass. A movement across the field caught his eye. A flash of red. Red. Philip smiled to himself as he shook his head. It must be Marina. Red was her favorite color, something that he'd always found odd. Anyone who spent any time with her would have surely thought she'd prefer something darker, more somber. He watched as she disappeared into the wooded copse, then got back to work. It was rare for Marina to venture outside. These days, she didn't often leave the confines of her bedchamber. Philip was happy to see her out in the sun. Maybe it would restore her spirits. Not completely, of course. Philip didn't think even the sun had the ability to do that. But maybe a bright, warm day would be enough to draw her out for a few hours, bring a small smile to her face. Heaven knew the children could use that. They visited their mother in her room almost every evening, but it wasn't enough. And Philip knew that this lack was not made up for by him. He sighed, a wave of guilt washing over him. He was not the sort of father they needed, he knew that. He tried to tell himself that he was doing his best that he was succeeding in what was his only goal when it came to parenthood that he not behave in the manner of his own father. But still he knew it wasn't enough. With resolute motions, he pushed himself away from his workbench. The seats could wait. His children could probably wait, too, but that didn't mean they should. And he ought to take them on their nature walk, not nurse mills by who didn't know a deciduous tree from a coniferous and would most likely tell them that a rose was a daisy, and... He glanced out the window again, reminding himself that it was February. Nurse Millsby wasn't likely to locate any sort of flower in this weather, but still, it didn't excuse the fact that he ought to take the children on their nature walk. 
It was the one sort of children's activity at which he truly excelled, and he ought not shirk the responsibility. He strode out of the greenhouse, but then stopped, not even a third of the way back to Romney Hall. If he was going to fetch the children, he ought to take them out to see their mother. They craved her company, even when she did nothing more than pat them on the head. Yes, they should find Marina. That would be even more beneficial than a nature walk. But he knew from experience that he ought not make assumptions about Marina's state of mind. Just because she ventured outside did not mean that she was feeling well, and he hated when the children saw her in one of her moods. Philip turned around and headed out toward the copse where he'd seen Marina disappear just a few moments earlier. He walked with nearly twice the speed of Marina, it wouldn't take very long to catch up to her and ascertain her mood. He could be back at the nursery before the children set out with Nurse Millsby. He walked through the woods, easily following Marina's path. The ground was moist, and Marina must have been wearing heavy boots, because her prints had sunk into the earth with clear definition. They led down the slight incline and out of the woods, then onto a grassy patch. Damn, Philip muttered, the word barely audible as the wind picked up around him. It was impossible to see her footprints on the grass. He used his hand to shade his eyes from the sun and scan the horizon, looking for a telltale scrap of red. Not near the abandoned cottage, nor at Philip's field of experimental grains, nor at the large boulder that Philip had spent so many hours clambering upon when he was a child. He turned north, his eyes narrowing when he finally saw her. She was heading toward the lake. The lake. Philip's lips parted as he stared down at her form, moving slowly toward the water's edge. He wasn't quite frozen, it was more that he was, suspended, as his mind took in the strange sight. Marina didn't swim, he didn't even know if she could. He supposed she was aware that there was a lake on the grounds, but in truth, he'd never known her to go there, not in the eight years they'd been married. He started walking toward her, his feet somehow recognizing what his mind refused to accept. As she stepped into the shallows, he picked up speed, still too far to do anything but call out her name. But if she heard him, she made no indication, just continued her slow and steady progress into the depths. Marina, he screamed, now breaking into a run. He was still a good minute away, even moving at top speed. Marina. She reached the point where the bottom dropped off, and then she dropped off, too, disappearing under the gunmetal gray of the surface, her red cloak floating along the top for a few seconds before being sucked under after her. He yelled her name again, even though she couldn't possibly hear. He skidded and stumbled down the hill leading to the lake, then had just enough presence of mind to yank off his coat and boots before diving into the freezing cold water. She'd been under barely a minute. His mind recognized that that was probably not enough time to drown, but every second it took him to find her was one second toward her death. He'd swum in the lake countless times, knew exactly where the bottom dropped off and he reached that critical point with swift, even strokes, barely noticing the drag of the water against his heavy clothes. He could find her. He had to find her. Before it was too late. He dove down, his eyes scanning the murky water. Marina must have kicked up some of the sand from the bottom, and he had surely done the same, because the fine silt was swirling around him, the puffy opaque clouds making it difficult to see. But in the end, Marina was saved by her one colorful quirk, and Philip pumped through the water, down to the bottom where he saw the red of her cloak floating through the water like a languorous kite. She did not fight him as he pulled her to the surface, indeed, she had already lost consciousness and was nothing more than a dead weight in his arms. They broke out into the air, and he took Grage, carrot big gasps, to fill his burning lungs. For a moment he could do nothing but breathe, his body recognizing that it had to save itself before he could save anyone else. Then he pulled her along to the shore, careful to keep her face above water, even though she didn't seem to be breathing. Finally, they reached the water's edge, and he dragged her upon the narrow strip of dirt and pebbles that separated the water from the grass. With frantic movements he felt in front of her face for air, but there was none emerging from her lips. He didn't know what to do, hadn't thought he'd ever have to save someone from drowning, so he just did what seemed most sensible and heaved her over his lap, face down, whacking her on the back. Nothing happened at first, 
but after the fourth violent thrust, she coughed, and a stream of murky water erupted from her mouth. He turned her over quickly. Marina, he asked urgently, lightly slapping her face. Marina? She coughed again, her body racked by spasmodic tremors. Then she began to suck in air, her lungs forcing her to live, even when her soul desired something else. Marina, Philip said, his voice shaking with relief. Thank God. He didn't love her, had never really loved her, but she was his wife, and she was the mother of his children, and she was, deep down, beneath her unshakable cloak of sorrow and despair, a good and fine person. He may not have loved her, but he did not want her death. She blinked, her eyes unfocused. And then, finally, she seemed to realize where she was, who he was, and she whispered, No, I've got to get you back to the house, he said gruffly, startled by how angry he was over that single word. No. How dare she refuse his rescue? Would she give up on life just because she was sad? Did her melancholy amount to more? Than their two children? In the balance of life, did a bad mood weigh more than their need for a mother? I'm taking you home, he bit out, heaving her nun, too gently, into his arms. She was breathing now, and clearly in possession. Of her faculties, misguided though they may be. There was no need to treat her like a delicate flower. No, she sobbed quietly. Please don't. I don't want. I don't. You're going home, he stated, trudging up the hill, oblivious to the chill wind turning his sodden clothes to ice oblivious, even, to the rocky soil, pressing into his unshod feet. I can't, she whispered, with what seemed like her last ounce of energy. And as Philip carried his burden home, all he could think was how apt those words were. I can't. In a way, it seemed to sum up her entire life. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. By nightfall, it became apparent that fever might succeed where the lake had failed. Philip had carried Marina home as quickly as he was able, and, with the aid of Mrs. Hurley, his housekeeper, had stripped her of her icy garments and tried to warm her beneath the goose-down quilt that had been the centerpiece of her trousseau eight years earlier. What happened? Mrs. Hurley had gasped when he staggered through the kitchen door. He hadn't wanted to use the main entrance, where he might be seen by his children, and besides, the kitchen door was closer, by a good twenty yards. She fell in the lake, he said gruffly. Mrs. Hurley gave him a look that was somehow dubious and sympathetic all at the same time, and he knew that she knew the truth. She had worked for the Cranes since their marriage, she knew Marina's moods. She had shooed him out of the room once they had Marina in bed, insisting that he change his own clothing before he caught his death as well. He had returned, though, to Marina's side. That was his place as her husband, he thought guiltily, a place he had avoided in recent years. It was depressing to be with Marina. It was hard, but now wasn't the time to shirk his duties, and so he sat at her bedside throughout the day and into the night. He mopped her brow when she began to perspire, tried to pour lukewarm broth down her throat when she was calm. He told her to fight, even though he knew his words fell on deaf ears. Three days later she was dead. It was what she'd wanted, but that was little calm fort as Philip faced his children, twins, just turned seven years old, and tried to explain that their mother was gone. He sat in their nursery, his large frame too big for any of their tot-sized chairs. But he sat, anyway, twisted like a pretzel, and forced himself to meet their gazes as he wrenched out the words. They said little, which was unlike them. But they didn't look surprised, which Philip found disturbing. I am sorry, he choked out, once he reached the end of his speech. He loved them so much, and he failed them in so many ways. He barely knew how to be a father to them, how in hell was he meant to take on the role of mother as well. It's not your fault, Oliver said, his brown eyes capturing his father's with an intensity that was unsettling. She fell in the lake, didn't she? You didn't push her. Philip only nodded, unsure of how to respond. Is she happy now? Amanda asked softly. I think so, Philip said. She gets to watch you all the time now from heaven, so she must be happy. 
The twins seemed to consider that for quite some time. I hope she's happy, Oliver finally said, his voice more resolute than his expression. Maybe she won't cry anymore, Philip felt his breath catch in his throat. He hadn't realized that they had heard Marina's sobs. She only seemed to sink so low. Late at night, their room was directly above hers, but he'd always assumed they'd already fallen asleep when their mother started to cry. Amanda nodded her agreement, her little blonde head bobbing up and down. If she's happy now, she said, then I'm glad she's gone. She's not gone, Oliver cut in. She's dead. No, she's gone, Amanda persisted. It's the same thing, Philip said, flatly, wishing he had something to tell them other than the truth. But I think she's happy now. And in a way, that was the truth, too. It was what Marina had wanted, after all. Maybe it was all she had wanted all along. Amanda and Oliver were quiet for a long while, both keeping their eyes on the floor as their legs swung from their perch on Oliver's bed. They looked so small, sitting there on a bed that was clearly too high for them. Philip frowned. How was it that? He'd never noticed this before? Shouldn't they be on lower beds? What if they fell off in the night? Or maybe they were too big for all that. Maybe they didn't fall out of bed any longer. Maybe they never had. Maybe he truly was an abominable father. Maybe he should know these things. Maybe, maybe. He closed his eyes and sighed. Maybe he should stop thinking quite so much and simply try his best and be happy with that. Are you going to go away? Amanda asked, raising her head. He looked into her eyes, so blue, so like her mother's. No, he whispered fiercely, kneeling before her and taking her tiny hands, in his own. They looked so small in his grasp, so fragile. No, he repeated. I'm not going away. I'm not ever going away. Philip looked down at his whiskey glass. It was empty again. Funny how a whiskey glass could go empty even after one filled it four times. He hated remembering. He wasn't sure what was the worst. Was it the dive underwater or the moment Mrs. Hurley had turned to him and said, she's gone? Or was it his children, the sorrow on their faces, the fear in their eyes? He lifted the glass to his lips, letting the final drop slide into his mouth. The worst part was definitely his children. He'd told them he wouldn't ever leave them, and he hadn't he wouldn't, but his simple presence wasn't enough. They needed more. They needed someone who knew how to be a parent, who knew how to speak to them and understand them and get them to mind and behave. And since he couldn't very well get them another father, he supposed he ought to think about finding them a mother. It was. Too soon, of course. He couldn't marry anyone until his prescribed period of mourning was completed, but that didn't mean he couldn't look. He sighed, slumping in his seat. He needed a wife. Almost any wife would do. He didn't care what she looked like. He didn't care if she had money. He didn't care if she could do sums in her head or speak French or even ride a horse. She just had to be happy. Was that so much to want in a wife? A smile, at least once a day. Maybe even the sound of her laughter? And she had to love his children, or at least pretend so well that they never knew the difference. It wasn't so much to ask for, was it? Sir Philip? Philip looked up, cursing himself for having left his study door slightly ajar. Miles Carter, his secretary, was poking his head in. What is it? A letter. Sir, Miles said, walking forward to hand him an envelope. From London. Philip looked down at the envelope in his hand, his brows rising at the obviously feminine slant to the handwriting. He dismissed Miles with a nod, then picked up his letter opener and slid it under the wax. A single sheet of paper slipped out. Philip rubbed it between his fingers. High quality. Expensive. Heavy, too, a clear sign that the sender need not economize to reduce franking costs. Then he turned it over and read. Number 5, Bruton Street. London. Sir Philip Crane, I am writing to express my condolences on the loss of your wife, my dear cousin, Marina. 
Although it has been many years since I last saw Marina, I remember her fondly and was deeply saddened to hear of her passing. Please do not hesitate to write if there is anything I can do to ease your pain at this difficult time. YRS, Miss Eloise Bridgerton Philip rubbed his eyes. Bridgerton Bridgerton Did Marina have Bridgerton cousins? She must have done, if one of them was sending him a letter. He sighed, then surprised himself by reaching for his own stationery and quill. He'd received precious few condolence notes since Marina had died. It seemed most of her friends and family had forgotten her since her marriage. He supposed he shouldn't be upset or even surprised. She'd rarely left her bedchamber. It was easy to forget about someone one never saw. Miss Bridgerton deserved a reply. It was common courtesy, or even if it wasn't, and Philip was quite certain he didn't know the full etiquette of one's wife dying, it still somehow seemed like the right thing to do. And so, with a weary breath, he put his quill to paper. Chapter 1 May 1824 Somewhere on the road from London to Gloucestershire The middle of the night Dear Miss Bridgerton Thank you for your kind note at the BSS of my wife. It was thoughtful of you to take the time to write to a gentleman you have never met. I offer you this pressed flower as thanks, it is not but the simple red. Campion, Silene Dioica, but it brightens the fields here in Gloucestershire, and indeed seems to have arrived early this year. It was Marina's favorite wildflower. Sincerely, Sir Philip Crane, Eloise Bridgerton smoothed the well-read sheet of paper across her lap. There was little light by which to see the words, even with the full moon shining through the windows of the coach, but that didn't really matter. She had the entire letter memorized, and the delicate pressed flower, which was actually more pink than red, was safely protected between the pages of a book. She'd nipped from her brother's library. She hadn't been too terribly surprised when she'd received a reply from Sir Philip. Good manners dictated as much, although. Even Eloise's mother, surely the supreme arbiter of good behavior, said that Eloise took her correspondence a bit too seriously. It was common, of course, for ladies of Eloise's station to spend several hours each week writing letters, but Eloise had long since fallen into the habit of taking that amount of time each day. She enjoyed writing notes, especially to people she hadn't. Seen in years, she'd always liked to imagine their surprise when they opened her envelope, and so she pulled out her pen and paper for most any occasion births, deaths, any sort of achievement that deserved congratulations or condolences. She wasn't sure why she kept sending her missives, just that she spent so much time writing letters to whichever of her siblings were not in residence in London at the time, and it seemed easy enough to pen a short note to some far-off relative while she was seated at her escritoire. And although everyone penned a short note in reply she was a Bridgerton, of course, and no one wanted to offend a Bridgerton never had anyone enclosed a gift, even something so humble as a pressed flower. Eloise closed her eyes, picturing the delicate pink petals. It was hard to imagine a man handling such a fragile bloom. Her four brothers were all big, strong men with broad shoulders and large hands that would surely mangle the poor thing in a heartbeat. She had been intrigued by Sir Philip's reply, especially his use of the Latin, and she had immediately penned her own response. Dear Sir Philip, Dash, thank you so very much for the charming pressed flower. It was such a lovely surprise when it floated out. Of the envelope. And such a precious memento of dear Marina, as well. I could not help but notice your facility with the flower scientific name. Are you a botanist? Yours, Miss Eloise Bridgerton. It was sneaky of her to end her letter with a question. Now the poor man would be forced to respond again. He did not disappoint her. It had taken only ten days for Eloise to receive his reply. Dear Miss Bridgerton. Indeed, I am a botanist trained at Cambridge, although I am not currently connected with any university or scientific board. I conduct experiments here at Romney Hall, in my own greenhouse. Are you of a scientific? Bent as well? Yours, Sir Philip Crane. Something about the correspondence was thrilling, perhaps it was simply the excitement of finding someone not related to her. 
who actually seemed eager to conduct a written dialogue. Whatever it was, Eloise wrote back immediately. Dear Sir Philip. Heavens, no, I have not the scientific mind, I'm afraid, although I do have a fair head for sums. My interests. Lie more in the humanities, you may have noticed that I enjoy penning letters. Yours in friendship, Eloise Bridgerton. Eloise hadn't been certain about signing with such an informal salutation, but she decided to err on the side of daring. Sir Philip was obviously enjoying the correspondence as much as she, surely he wouldn't have finished his missive with a question, otherwise? Her answer came a fortnight later. My dear, Miss Bridgerton. Ah, but it is a sort of friendship, isn't it? I confess to a certain measure of isolation here in the country, and if one cannot have a smiling face across one's breakfast table, then one might at least have an amiable letter, don't you agree? I have enclosed another flower for you. This one is geranium pretense, more commonly known as the Meadow Crane's Bill. With great regard, Philip Crane. Eloise remembered that day well. She had sat in her chair, the one by the window in her bedchamber, and stared at the carefully pressed purple flower for what seemed like an eternity. Was he attempting to court her? Through the post? And then one day she received a note that was quite different from the rest. My dear, Miss Bridgerton. We have been corresponding now for quite some time, and although we have never formally met, I feel as if. I know you, I hope you feel the same. Forgive me if I am too bold, but I am writing to invite you to visit me here at Romney Hall. It is my hope that after a suitable period of time, we might decide that we will suit, and you will consent to be my wife. You will, of course, be properly chaperoned. If you accept my invitation, I will make immediate plans to bring my widowed aunt to Romney Hall. I do hope you will consider my proposal. Yours, as always, Philip Crane. Eloise had immediately tucked the letter away in a drawer, unable to even fathom his request. He wanted to marry someone he didn't even know? No, to be fair, that wasn't entirely true. They did know one another. They'd said more in the course of a year's correspondence than many husbands and wives did during the entire course of a marriage. But still, they'd never met. Eloise thought about all of the marriage proposals she'd refused over the years. How many had there been? At least six. Now. She couldn't even remember why she'd refused some of them. No reason, really, except that they weren't. Perfect. Was that so much to expect? She shook her head, aware that she sounded silly and spoiled. No, she didn't need someone perfect. She just needed someone perfect for her. She knew what the society matrons said about her. She was too demanding, worse than foolish. She'd end up a spinster now, they didn't say that anymore. They said she already was a spinster, which was true. One didn't reach the age of eight and twenty without hearing that whispered behind one's back or thrown in one's face. But the funny truth was Eloise didn't mind her situation. Or at least she hadn't, not until recently. It had never occurred to her that she'd always be a spinster and besides, she enjoyed her life quite well. She had the most marvelous family one could imagine seven brothers and sisters in all, named alphabetically, which put her right in the middle. At E, with four older and three younger. Her mother was a delight, and she'd even stopped nagging Eloise about getting married. Eloise still held a prominent place in society, the Bridgertons were universally adored and respected, and occasionally feared and Eloise's sunny and irrepressible personality was such that everyone sought out her company, spinsterish age or no. But lately, she sighed, suddenly feeling quite a bit older than her 28 years. Lately, she hadn't been feeling so sunny. Lately, she'd been starting to think that maybe those crotchety old matrons were right, and she wasn't going to find herself a husband. Maybe she had been too picky, too determined to follow the example of her older brothers and sister all of whom had found a deep and passionate love with their spouses, even if it hadn't necessarily been there at the outset. Maybe a marriage based on mutual respect and companionship was better than none at all. But it was difficult to talk about these feelings with anyone.
Her mother had spent so many years urging her to find a husband, as much as Eloise adored her, it would be difficult to eat crow and say that she should have listened. Her brothers would have been no help whatsoever. Anthony, the eldest, would probably have taken it upon himself to personally select a suitable mate and then browbeat the poor man into submission. Benedict was too much of a dreamer, and besides, he almost never came down to London anymore, preferring the quiet of the country. As for Colin Well, that was another story entirely, quite worthy of its own paragraph. She supposed she should have talked to Daphne, but every time she went to see her, her elder sister was so bloody happy, so blissfully in love with her husband and her life as mother to her brood of four. How could someone like that possibly offer useful advice to one in Eloise's position? And Francesca seemed half a world away, off in Scotland. Besides, Eloise didn't think it fair to bother her with her silly woes. Francesca had been widowed at the age of 23, for heaven's sake. Eloise's fears and worries seemed terribly inconsequential by comparison. And maybe all this was why her correspondence with Sir Philip had become such a guilty pleasure. The Bridgertons were a large family, loud and boisterous. It was nearly impossible to keep anything a secret, especially from her sisters, the youngest of whom Hyacinth could probably have won the war against Napoleon in half the time if His Majesty had only thought to draft her into the espionage service. Sir Philip was, in his own strange way, hers, the one thing she'd never had to share with anyone. His letters were bundled and tied with a purple ribbon, hidden at the bottom of her middle desk drawer, tucked underneath the piles of stationery she used for her many letters. He was her secret. Hers, and because she'd never actually met him, she'd been able to create him in her mind, using his letters as the bones and then fleshing him out as she saw fit. If ever there was a perfect man, surely it had to be the Sir Philip Crane of her imagination. And now he wanted to meet? Meet, was he mad? and ruin what had to be the perfect courtship. But then the impossible had occurred. Penelope Featherington, Eloise's closest friend for nearly a dozen years, had married. And what's more, she'd married Colin. Eloise's brother, if the moon had suddenly dropped from the sky and landed in her back garden, Eloise could not have been more surprised. Eloise was happy for Penelope. Truly, she was. And she was happy for Colin, too. They were quite possibly her two most favorite people in the entire world, and she was thrilled that they had found happiness. No one deserved it more. But that didn't mean that their marriage hadn't left a hollow spot in her life. She supposed that when she'd been considering her life as a spinster, and trying to convince herself that it was what she really wanted, Penelope had always been there in the image, spinster right beside her. It was acceptable, almost daring, even to be 28 and unmarried as long as Penelope was 28 and unmarried, as well. It wasn't that she hadn't wanted Penelope to find a husband, it was just that it had never seemed even the least bit likely. Eloise knew that Penelope was wonderful and kind and smart and witty, but the gentleman of the ton had never seemed to notice. In all her years in Society 11, in all, Penelope had not received one proposal of marriage nor even a whiff of interest. In a way, Eloise had counted on her to remain where she was, what she was first and foremost Eloise's friend. Her companion in spinsterhood, and the worst part the part that left Eloise racked with guilt was that she'd never given a thought to how Penelope might feel if she married first, which, in truth, she'd always supposed she would do. But now Penelope had Colin, and Eloise could see that the match was a splendid thing, and she was alone alone in the middle of crowded London, in the middle of a large and loving family. It was hard to imagine a lonelier spot. Suddenly, Sir Philip's bold proposal, tucked away at the very bottom of her bundle, at the bottom of the middle drawer, locked away in a newly purchased safe box, just so that Eloise wouldn't be tempted to look at it six times a day well, it seemed a bit more intriguing. More intriguing by the day, frankly, as she grew more and more restless, more dissatisfied with the lot in life that she had to admit she'd chosen. And so one day, after she'd gone to visit Penelope, only to be informed by the butler that Mr. and Mrs. Bridgerton were not able to receive visitors uttered in such a way that even Eloise knew what it meant, she made a decision, 
It was time to take her life into her own hands, time to control her destiny, rather than attending ball after ball in the vain hope that the perfect man would suddenly materialize before her, never mind that there was never anybody new in London, and after a full decade out in society, she'd already met everyone of the appropriate age and gender to marry. She told herself that this did not mean she had to marry Sir Philip, she was merely investigating what seemed like it might be. An excellent possibility. If they did not suit, they would not have to marry, she'd made no promises to him, after all. But if there was one thing about Eloise, it was that when she made a decision, she acted upon it quickly. No, she reflected with. A rather impressive, in her opinion, at least, display of self-honesty. There were two things about her that colored her every action she liked to act quickly, and she was tenacious. Penelope had once described her as akin to a dog with a bone. And Penelope had not been joking. Once Eloise got her claws into an idea, not even the full force of the Bridgerton family could sway her from her intended goal. And the Bridgertons constituted a mighty force, indeed. It was probably just dumb luck that her goals and those of her family had never crossed purposes before, at least not over anything important. Eloise knew that they would never countenance her going off blindly to meet a man she'd never met. Anthony would have probably demanded that Sir Philip come to London to meet the entire family en masse, and Eloise couldn't imagine a single scenario more likely to scare off a prospective suitor. The men who'd previously sought her favor were at least familiar with the London scene and knew what they were getting into, poor Sir Philip who had by his own admission in his letters not set foot in London since his school days, and never participated in the social season, would be ambushed. So the only option was for her to travel to Gloucestershire, and, as she came to realize after pondering the problem for a few days, she had to do it in secret. If her family knew of her plans, they might very well forbid her to go. Eloise was a worthy opponent, and she might prevail in the end, but it would be a long and painful battle. Not to mention that if they did allow her to go, whether after a protracted battle over the subject or not, they would insist upon sending at least two of their ranks to accompany her. Eloise shuddered. Those two would most probably be her mother and Hyacinth. Good gad, no one could fall in love with those two around, no one could even form a mild but lasting attachment, which Eloise thought she might actually be willing to settle for this go-around she decided that she would make her escape during her sister Daphne's ball. It was to be a grand affair, with hordes of guests, and just the right amount of noise and confusion to allow her absence to go unnoticed for a good six hours, maybe more. Her mother had always insisted that they be punctual early, even when a family member was hosting a social event, so they would surely arrive at Daphne's no later than eight. If she slipped away early on, and the ball did not wind down until the wee hours of the morning, well, it would be nearly dawn before anyone realized she was gone, and she could be halfway to Gloucestershire. And if not halfway, then far enough to ensure that they wouldn't find it too terribly easy to follow her trail. In the end, it had all proven almost frighteningly easy, her entire family had been distracted by some grand announcement Colin planned to make and so all she'd had to do was excuse herself to the lady's retiring room, slip out the back, and walk the short distance to her own home, where she'd hidden her bags in the back garden. From there, she needed only to walk to the corner, where she'd arranged to have a hired coach waiting. Goodness, if she'd known it would be this easy to make her own way in the world, she would have done so years ago. And now here she was, rolling toward Gloucestershire, rolling toward destiny. She supposed or hoped, she wasn't sure which with nothing but a few changes of clothing and a pile of letters written to her by a man she'd never met. A man she hoped she could love. It was thrilling. No, it was terrifying. It was, she reflected, quite possibly the most foolhardy thing she'd done in her life, and she had to admit that she'd made a few foolish decisions in her day. Or it might just be her only chance at happiness. Eloise grimaced. She was growing fanciful. That was a bad sign. She needed to approach this adventure with all the practicality and pragmatism with which she always tried to make her decisions. There was still time to turn around. What did she know? About this man, really? He'd said quite a lot over the course of a year's correspondence. 
He was 30 years of age, two years her elder. He had attended Cambridge and studied botany. He had been married to her fourth cousin Marina for eight years, which meant that he'd been 21 at his wedding. He had brown hair. He had all of his teeth. He was a baronet. He lived at Romney Hall, a stone structure built in the 18th century near Tetbury, Gloucestershire. He liked to read scientific treatises and poetry but not novels and definitely not works of philosophy. He liked the rain. His favorite color was green. He had never traveled outside of England. He did not like fish. Eloise fought a bubble of nervous laughter. He didn't like fish? That was what she knew about him? Surely a sound basis for marriage, she muttered to herself, trying to ignore the panic in her voice. And what did he know about her? What could have possibly led him to propose marriage to a total stranger? She tried to recall what she had included in her many letters. She was 28. She had brown hair, chestnut, really, and all of her teeth. She had gray eyes. She came from a large and loving family. Her brother was a viscount. Her father had died when she was but a child, incomprehensibly brought down by a humblebee sting. She had a tendency to talk too much. Good God, had she really put that into writing? She liked to read poetry and novels, but certainly not scientific treatises or works of philosophy. She had traveled to Scotland, but that was all. Her favorite color was purple. She did not like mutton and positively detested blood pudding. Another little burst of panicked laughter passed over her lips. Put that way, she thought with no small bit of sarcasm, she seemed. A fine catch indeed. She glanced out the window, as if that might possibly give her an indication as to where they were on the road from London to Tetbury. Rolling green hills looked like rolling green hills looked like rolling green hills, and she could be in Wales, for all she knew. Frowning, she looked down at the paper in her lap and refolded Sir Philip's letter. Fitting it back into the ribbon-tied bundle she kept in her valise, she then tapped her fingers against her thighs in a nervous gesture. She had reason to be nervous. She had left home and all that was familiar, after all. She was traveling halfway across England, and no one knew. No one. Not even Sir Philip. Because in her haste to leave London, she'd neglected to tell him she was coming. It wasn't that she'd forgotten, rather, she'd sort of pushed the task aside until it was too late. If she told him, then she was committed to the plan. This way, she still had the chance to back out at any moment. She told herself it was because she liked to have choices and options, but the truth was, she was quite simply terrified, and she had feared a total loss of her courage. Besides, he was the one who had requested the meeting. He would be happy to see her. Wouldn't he? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Philip rose from bed and pulled open the draperies in his bedchamber revealing another perfect, sunny day. Perfect. He padded over to his dressing room to find some clothes, having long since dismissed the servants who used to perform. These duties. He couldn't explain it, but after Marina had died, he hadn't wanted anyone bustling into his bedroom in the morning, yanking open his curtains, and selecting his garments. He'd even dismissed Miles Carter, who had tried so hard to be a friend after Marina's passing. But somehow the young secretary just made him feel worse, and so he'd sent him on his way, along with six months' pay and a superb letter of reference. He'd spent his marriage with Marina looking for someone to talk to, since she was so often absent, but now that she was gone, all he wanted was his own company. He supposed he must have alluded to this in one of his many letters to the mysterious Eloise Bridgerton because he had sent off his proposal of not quite marriage but maybe something leading up to it over a month ago. And the silence on her part had been deafening, especially since she usually responded to his letters with charming alacrity. He frowned. The mysterious Eloise Bridgerton wasn't really so mysterious. In her letters she seemed quite open and honest and possessed of a positively sunny disposition, which, when it all came down to it, was all he really insisted upon in a wife this time around. He yanked on a work shirt, he planned to spend most of the day in the greenhouse up to his elbows in dirt. 
He was rather disappointed that Miss Bridgerton had obviously decided he was some sort of deranged lunatic to be avoided at all costs. She had seen the perfect solution to his problems. He desperately needed a mother for Amanda and Oliver, but they'd grown so unmanageable that he couldn't imagine any woman willingly agreeing to cleave unto him in marriage and thus bind herself to those two little devils for life, or at least until they reached majority. Miss Bridgerton was eight and twenty, however, quite obviously a spinster. And she'd been corresponding with a complete stranger for over a year, surely she was a little desperate? Wouldn't she appreciate the chance to find a husband? He had a home, a respectable fortune, and was only thirty years of age, what more could she want? He muttered several annoyed phrases as he thrust his legs into his rough woolen trousers. Obviously she wanted something more, else she would have had the courtesy to at least write back and decline. Thump. Philip glanced up at the ceiling and grimaced. Romney Hall was old and solid and very well built, and if his ceiling was thumping, then his children had dropped, pushed, hurled, something very large indeed. Thump. He winced. That one sounded even worse. Still, their nurse was up there with them, and she always managed them better than he did. If he could just get his boots on in under a minute, he could be out of the house before they inflicted too much more damage, and thus he could pretend none of it was happening. He reached for his boots. Yes, excellent idea. Out of earshot, out of mind. He donned the rest of his ensemble with impressive speed and dashed out into the hall making quick strides toward the stairs. Sir Philip. Sir Philip. Damn. His butler was after him now. Philip pretended he didn't hear. Sir Philip, curse it, he muttered. There was no way he could ignore that bellow unless he was willing to suffer the torture of his servants hovering over him, concerned about his apparent hearing loss. Yes, he said, turning around slowly, gunning. Sir Philip, Gunning said, clearing his throat. We have a caller. A caller? Philip echoed. Was that the source of the, ah, uh, noise? Gunning supplied helpfully. Yes. No. The butler cleared his throat. That would have been your children. I see, Philip murmured. How silly of me to have hoped otherwise. I don't believe they broke anything, sir. That's a relief and a change. Indeed, sir, but there is the caller to consider. Philip groaned. Who on earth was visiting at this time of the morning? It wasn't like they were used to receiving callers even during reasonable hours. Denning attempted a smile, but one could see that he was out of practice. We used to have callers, do you recall? That was the problem with butlers who'd worked for the family since, before one was born. They tended to think highly of sarcasm. Who is this caller? I'm not entirely certain, sir. You're not certain? Philip asked disbelievingly. I didn't inquire. Isn't that what butlers are meant to do? Inquire, sir? Yes, Philip ground out, wondering if Gunning was trying to see how red in the face his employer could get without actually collapsing to the floor in an apoplectic fit. I thought I'd let you inquire, sir. You thought you'd let me inquire. This one came out as a statement, Philip having realized the futility of asking questions. Yes, sir. She's here to see you, after all. So are all of our callers, and that has never stopped you from ascertaining their identities before. Well, actually, sir. I'm quite certain Philip tried to interrupt. We don't have callers, sir, Gunning finished quite clearly winning the conversational battle. Philip opened his mouth to point out that they did have callers, there was one downstairs that very moment, but really, what, was the point? Fine, he said, thoroughly irritated. I'll go downstairs. Gunning beamed. Excellent, sir. Philip stared at his butler in shock. Are you unwell, Gunning? No, sir. Why do you ask, sir? It didn't seem quite polite to point out that the broad smile made Gunning look a bit like a horse, so Philip just muttered, it's nothing, and headed down the stairs. A caller? Who would be calling? 
no one had come to visit in nearly a year, since the neighbors had finished making their obligatory condolence calls. He supposed he couldn't really blame them for staying away the last time one of them had come. To visit, Oliver and Amanda had smeared strawberry jam on the chairs. Lady Winslet had left in a fit of temper, quite beyond anything Philip would have thought healthy for a woman of her years. Philip frowned as he reached the bottom of the stairs and turned into the entry hall. It was a she, wasn't it? Hadn't Gunning said his visitor was a she, who the devil? He stopped short, stumbled, even. Because the woman standing in his entry hall was young and quite pretty, and when she looked up to meet his gaze, he saw that she had the largest, most achingly beautiful gray eyes he'd ever seen. He could drown in those eyes, and Philip did not, as one might imagine, even think the word drown lightly. Chapter 2 And then, I'm sure you will not be surprised to hear, I talked far too much. I simply couldn't stop talking, but I suppose that is what I do when I am nervous. One can only hope I have less cause for nerves as the rest of my life unfolds. From Eloise Bridgerton to her brother Colin, upon the occasion of Eloise's debut into London society. Then she opened her mouth. Sir Philip, she asked, and before he even had a chance to nod in the affirmative, she said, at quite the speed of lightning, I'm so terribly sorry to arrive unannounced, but I really had no other option, and to be honest, if I'd sent notice, it probably would have arrived behind me, making the notice really quite moot, as I'm sure you'll agree, and Philip blinked, certain he was supposed to be following what she was saying, but no longer able to make out where one word ended and the next began. A long journey, and I'm afraid I didn't sleep, and so I must beg you to forgive my appearance, and she was making him dizzy. Would it be rude if he sat down? Didn't bring very much, but I had no choice, and this had clearly gone on far too long, with no sign, in truth, that it would ever end. If he allowed her to speak for one moment longer, he was quite certain that he would suffer an inner ear imbalance, or perhaps she would swoon from lack of breath and hit her head on the floor. Either way, one of them would be injured and in debilitating pain. Madam, he said, clearing his throat. If she heard him, she gave no indication, instead saying something about the coach that had apparently conveyed her to his doorstep. Madam, he said, a little louder this time. But then I, she looked up, blinking those devastating gray eyes at him, and for a moment he felt frighteningly off balance. Yes, she asked. Now that he had her attention, he seemed to have forgotten why he'd sought it. Air, he asked, who are you? She stared at him for a good five seconds, her lips parting with surprise, and then she finally answered, Eloise Bridgerton, of course. Eloise was fairly certain she was talking too much and she knew she was talking too fast, but she tended to do that when she was nervous, and while she prided herself on the fact that she was rarely nervous, now seemed like a rather deserving time to explore that emotion, and besides, Sir Philip if indeed he was the large bear of a man standing before her was not at all what she had expected. Your Eloise Bridgerton? She looked up into his gaping face and felt the first stirrings of annoyance. Well, of course I am. Who else would I be? I could not possibly imagine. You did invite me, she pointed out. And you did not respond to my invitation, he returned. She swallowed, he had a point there. A rather large one, if one wanted to be fair, which she didn't. Not just then, anyway. I didn't really have the opportunity, she hedged, and then, when it seemed from his expression that that wasn't enough explanation, she added, as I mentioned when I spoke earlier. He stared at her for longer than made her comfortable, his dark eyes inscrutable, and then he said, I didn't understand a word you said. She felt her mouth form an oval of, surprise? No, annoyance. Weren't you listening? she asked. I tried. Eloise pursed her lips. Very well, then, she said, counting to five in her head in Latin, before adding, my apologies. I am sorry to have arrived unannounced. It was dreadfully ill-bred of me. He was silent for a full three seconds. Eloise counted that as well before saying, I accept your apology. She cleared her throat. 
And of course, he coughed, glancing around as if in search of someone who might save him from her, I am delighted. That you are here. It would probably be impolite to point out that he sounded anything but delighted, so Eloise just stood there, staring at his right cheekbone as she tried to decide what she could say without insulting him. Eloise considered it a sad state of affairs that she who generally had something to say for any occasion couldn't think of. A thing. Luckily, he saved their awkward silence from growing to monumental proportions by asking, Is this all of your luggage? Eloise straightened her shoulders, delighted to move on to a comparatively trivial topic. Yes. I didn't really, she broke herself off. Did she really need to tell him that she'd stolen away from home in the middle of the night? It didn't seem to speak well of her, or of her family, for that matter. She wasn't sure why. But she didn't want him to know that she had, for all intents and purposes, run away. She wasn't certain why she thought so, but she had a distinct feeling that if he knew the truth, he'd pack her up and send her back to London post-haste. And while her meeting with Sir Philip had not thus far proven to be the stuff of romance and bliss she'd imagined it to be, she was not yet prepared to give up. Especially when that meant running back to her family with her tail between her legs. This is all I have, she said firmly. Good. I, er. He looked around again, this time a little desperately, which Eloise did not find flattering in the least. Gunning. He bellowed. The butler appeared so quickly that he must have been eavesdropping. Yes, sir? We, ah, uh, need to prepare a room for Miss Bridgerton. I have already done so, Gunning assured him. Sir Philip's cheeks colored slightly. Good, he grunted. She will be staying here for. He looked to her in askance. A fortnight, she supplied, hoping that was about the right amount of time. A fortnight, slash, Sir Philip reiterated as if the butler wouldn't have heard her reply. We will do everything in our power to make. Her comfortable, of course. Of course, the butler agreed. Good, Sir Philip said, still looking somewhat uncomfortable with the entire situation. Or if not uncomfortable, precisely, then perhaps weary, which might have been even worse. Eloise was disappointed. She'd pictured him as a man of easy charm, rather like her brother Colin, who possessed a dashing smile and always knew what to say in any situation, awkward or otherwise. Sir Philip, on the other hand, looked as if he'd rather be anywhere else but where he was, which Eloise did not find encouraging, as his present surroundings included her. And what's more, he was supposed to be making at least some effort to make her acquaintance and determine if she would make him an acceptable wife. And his efforts had better be good ones indeed, because if it was true that first impressions were the most accurate, she rather doubted that she would determine that he would make an acceptable husband. She smiled at him through gritted teeth. Would you like to sit down, he blurted out. That would be quite pleasing, thank you. He looked around with a blank expression on his face, giving Eloise the impression he barely knew his way around his own. House? Here, he mumbled, motioning to a door at the end of the hall, the drawing room. Gunning coughed. Sir Philip looked at him and scowled. Perhaps you intended to order refreshments. Sir, the butler asked solicitously. Air, yes, of course, Sir Philip replied, clearing his throat. Of course. Air, perhaps. A tea tray, perhaps? Gunning suggested. With muffins? Excellent, Sir Philip muttered. Or perhaps if Miss Bridgerton is hungry, the butler continued, I could have a more extensive breakfast prepared. Sir Philip swung his gaze over to Eloise. Muffins will be lovely, she said, even though she was hungry. Eloise allowed Sir Philip to take her arm and lead her to the drawing room, where she sat on a sofa covered in striped blue. Satin. The room was neat and clean, but the furnishings were shabby. The entire house had a vague neglected quality to it, as if the owner had run out of money, or perhaps just didn't care. Eloise tended to think that it was the latter. She supposed it was possible that Sir Philip was short of funds, but the grounds had been magnificent, and she had seen enough of his greenhouse as she was driving in to realize that it was in excellent condition. 
Given that Sir Philip was a botanist, that might explain the great care given to the exterior while the interior was left to fade. Clearly, he needed a wife. She folded her hands in her lap, then watched as he took a seat across from her, folding his large frame into a chair that had obviously been designed for one much smaller than he. He looked most uncomfortable and, and Eloise had enough brothers to recognize the signs, rather like he wanted desperately to curse, but Eloise decided it was his own fault for choosing that chair, and so she smiled at him in what she hoped was a polite and encouraging manner, waiting for him to begin the conversation. He cleared his throat. She leaned forward. He cleared his throat again. She coughed. He cleared his throat once more. Do you need some tea? She finally asked, unable to bear even the thought of one more ahem. He looked up gratefully, although Eloise wasn't certain whether that was due to her offer of tea or her merciful breaking of the silence. Yes, he said, that would be lovely. Eloise opened her mouth to reply, then remembered she was in his house and had no business offering tea. Not to mention that. He ought to have remembered that fact as well. Right, she said. Well, I'm sure it will be here soon. Right, he agreed, shifting in his seat. I'm sorry to have come by unannounced, she murmured, even though she'd already said as much. But something had to be said, Sir Philip might be well used to awkward pauses, but Eloise was the sort who liked to fill any silence. It's quite all right, he said. It's not, actually, she replied. It was terribly ill-mannered of me to do so, and I apologize. He looked startled at her frankness. Thank you, he murmured. It is no problem, I assure you. I was merely surprised, she offered. Yes. She nodded. Yes, well, anyone would have been. I should have thought of that, and I truly am sorry for the inconvenience. He opened his mouth, but then closed it, instead glancing out the window. It's a sunny day, he said. Yes, it is, Eloise agreed, thinking that quite obvious. He shrugged, I imagine it will still rain by nightfall. She wasn't quite certain how to respond to that, so she just nodded, surreptitiously studying him while his gaze was still fixed on the window. He was bigger than she'd imagined him, rougher looking, less urbane. His letters had been so charming and well written, she'd pictured him to be more smooth. More slender, perhaps, certainly not given to fat, but still, less muscled. He looked as if he worked outside like a laborer, especially in those rough trousers and shirt with no cravat, and even though he'd written that his hair was brown, she'd always imagined him as a dark blonde, looking rather like a poet, why she always pictured poets with blonde hair she did not know. But his hair was exactly as he'd described it brown, a rather dark shade, actually, bordering on black with an unruly wave to it. His eyes were brown, much the same shade as his hair, so dark they were utterly unreadable. She frowned. She hated people she couldn't figure out in a heartbeat. Did you travel all night? he inquired politely. I did. You must be tired. She nodded. I am, quite. He stood, motioning gallantly to the door. Would you prefer to rest? I don't wish to keep you here if you'd rather sleep. Eloise was exhausted, but she was also ferociously hungry. I'll have just a bite to eat first, she said, and then I would be grateful to accept your hospitality and rest. He nodded and started to sit down, trying to fold himself back into the ridiculously small chair, then finally muttering something under his breath, turning to her with a slightly more intelligible, excuse me, and moving to another, larger chair. I beg your pardon, he said, once he was settled. Eloise just nodded at him, wondering when she had ever found herself in a more awkward situation. He cleared his throat. Air, was your journey a pleasant one? Indeed, she replied, mentally giving him credit for at least trying to keep up a conversation. One good turn deserved another, so she made her contribution with, you have a lovely home. He raised a brow at that giving her a look that said he didn't believe her false flattery, for a second. The grounds are magnificent, she added hastily. Who would have thought that he'd actually know his furnishings were faded? 
men never noticed such things. Thank you, he said. I am a botanist, as you know, and so I spend a great deal of my time out of doors. Were you planning to work outside today? He answered in the affirmative. Eloise offered him a tentative smile. I'm sorry to have disrupted your schedule. It is nothing, I assure you. But. You really needn't apologize again, he cut in. For anything. And then there was that awful silence again, with both of them looking longingly at the door, waiting for Gunning to return with salvation in the form of a tea tray. Eloise tapped her hands against the cushion of the sofa in a manner that her mother would have deemed horribly ill-bred. She looked over at Sir Philip and was somewhat gratified to see that he was doing the same. Then he caught her looking and quirked an irritating half-smile as his gaze dropped down to her restless hand. She stilled herself immediately. She looked over at him, silently daring imploring him to say something. Anything. He didn't. This was killing her. She had to break the silence. This was not natural. It was too awful. People were meant to talk. This was. She opened her mouth, driven by a desperation she didn't quite understand. I. But before she could continue on with a sentence she fully intended to make up as she went along, a blood-curdling scream ripped through the air. Eloise jumped to her feet. What was? My children, Sir Philip said, letting out a haggard sigh. You have children? He noticed that she was standing and rose wearily to his feet. Of course. She gaped at him. You never said you had children. His eyes narrowed. Is that a problem? he asked, quite sharply. Of course it isn't, she said, bristling. I adore children. I have more nieces and nephews than I can count, and I can assure you that I am their favorite aunt. But that does not excuse the fact that you did not mention their existence. That is impossible, he said, shaking his head. You must have overlooked it. Her chin jerked back so suddenly it was a wonder she didn't snap her neck. That is not, she said haughtily, the sort of thing. I would overlook. He shrugged, clearly dismissing her protest. You never mentioned them, she said, and I can prove it. He crossed his arms, giving her a patently disbelieving look. She marched to the door. Where's my valise? Right where you left it, I imagine, he said, watching her with a condescending expression. Or more likely already up in your room. My servants are not that inattentive. She turned to him with a scowl. I have every single one of your letters with me, and I can assure you, not one of them contains the words, my children. Philip's lips parted in surprise. You saved my letters? Of course. Didn't you save mine? He blinked. Ah, uh, she gasped. You didn't save them? Philip had never understood women and half the time was quite willing to put aside all current medical thought and declare them a separate species altogether. He fully accepted that he rarely knew what one was supposed to say to them, but this time even, he knew he had blundered badly. I'm sure I have some of them, he tried. Her jaw clamped into a straight angry line. Most of them, I'm sure, he added hastily. She looked mutinous. Eloise Bridgerton, he was coming to realize, had a formidable will. It's not that I would have disposed of them, he said, trying to dig his way out of his bottomless pit. It is just that I'm not certain precisely where I put them. He watched with interest as she gained control of her anger, then let out a short breath. Her eyes, however, remained a stormy gray. Very well, she said. It hardly signifies, anyway. Exactly his opinion, Philip thought, but even he was smart enough not to say so. Besides, her tone made it quite clear that in her opinion, it did signify. A great deal. Another scream rent the air, followed by a resounding crash. Philip winced. It sounded like furniture. Eloise glanced toward the ceiling, as if expecting plaster to start spinning down at any moment. Shouldn't you go to them? She asked. He should, but by all that was holy, he didn't want to. When the twins were out of control, no one could manage them, which, Philip supposed, was the definition of out of control. 
It was his opinion that it was generally easier to let them run wild until they dropped from exhaustion, which usually didn't take too long, and deal with them then. It probably wasn't the most beneficial course of action, and certainly nothing that any other parent would have recommended, but a man only had so much energy to deal with two eight-year-olds, and he feared he'd run out of his a good six months ago. Sir Philip? Eloise prodded, he let out a breath. You're right, of course. It certainly wouldn't do to appear a disinterested parent in front of Miss Bridgerton, whom he was trying to woo, however clumsily, into the position of mother to the two Hellions, presently attempting the complete destruction of his home. If you will excuse me, he said, giving her a nod as he stepped into the hall. Oliver, he bellowed. Amanda. He wasn't sure, but he thought he heard Miss Bridgerton stifle a horrified laugh. A wave of irritation washed over him, and he glared at her, even though he knew he shouldn't. He supposed she thought. She could do a better job with those two Hellions. He strode to the stairs and yelled the twins' names again. On the other hand, maybe he shouldn't be so uncharitable. He rather hoped no, fervently prayed that Eloise Bridgerton could do a better job with the twins than he could. Good God, if she could teach them to mind, he would bloody well kiss the ground she walked upon on a thrice-daily schedule. Oliver and Amanda rounded the corner in the staircase and descended the rest of the way down to the hall, looking not a bit sheepish. What, Philip demanded, was that all about? What was what all about? Oliver replied cheekily. The screaming, Philip ground out, that was Amanda, Oliver said. It certainly was, she agreed. Philip waited for further elucidation, and when it appeared that none was forthcoming, he added, and why was Amanda screaming? It was a frog, she explained. A frog. She nodded. Indeed. In my bed, I see, Philip said. Do you have any idea how it got there? I put it there, she replied. He swung his gaze off of Oliver, to whom he'd addressed his question, and back to Amanda. You put a frog in your own bed? She nodded. Why, why, why? He cleared his throat. Why? She shrugged. I wanted to. Philip felt his chin thrust forward in disbelief. You wanted to? Yes. Put a frog in your bed? I was trying to grow tadpoles, she explained. In your bed? It seemed warm and cozy. I helped, Oliver put in. Of that I had no doubt, Philip said in a tight voice. But why did you scream? I didn't scream, Oliver said indignantly. Amanda did. I was asking Amanda. Philip said, just barely resisting the urge to throw his arms up in defeat and retire to his greenhouse. You were looking at me, sir, Oliver said. And then, as if his father were too dim to understand what he meant, he added, when you asked the question. Philip took a deep breath before schooling his features into what he hoped was a patient expression and turned back to Amanda. Why, Amanda, did you scream? She shrugged. I forgot I put the frog there. I thought she was going to die. Oliver put in, most dramatically. Philip decided not to pursue that statement. I thought, he said, crossing his arms and leveling his sternest gaze at his children that we had said no frogs in the house. No, Oliver said, with vehement nodding from Amanda, you said no toads. No amphibians of any kind, Philip ground out. But what if one of them is dying? Amanda asked, her pretty blue eyes filling with tears. Not even then. But, you may tend to it outside. What if it's cold and freezing and only needs my care and a warm bed inside the house? Frogs are supposed to be cold and freezing, Philip shot back. It's why they are amphibians. But what if? No, he bellowed. No frogs, toads, crickets, grasshoppers, or animals of any kind in the house. Amanda started gulping for air. But but but. Philip let out a long sigh. He never knew what to say to his children, and now his daughter looked as if she might dissolve into. A pool of tears. For the love of, he caught himself just in time and softened his voice. What is it, Amanda? She gasped, then sobbed, what about Bessie? 
Philip felt around unsuccessfully for a wall to sag against. Naturally, he ground out, I did not intend to include our beloved Spaniel in that statement. Well, I wish you'd said so, Amanda sniffed, looking surprisingly and suspiciously recovered. You made me extremely sad. Philip gritted his teeth. I am sorry I made you feel sad, she nodded at him like a queen. Philip groaned. When had the twins gained the upper hand in the conversation? Surely a man of his size, and he'd like to. Think, anyway, intellect, ought to be able to manage two eight-year-olds. But no, once again, despite his best intentions, he'd lost all control of the conversation and now he was actually apologizing. To them. Nothing made him feel more like a failure. Right, then, he said, eager to be done. Run along. I'm very busy. They stood there for a moment, just looking up at him with wide, blinking eyes. All day? Oliver finally asked. All day? Philip echoed. What the devil was he talking about? Are you going to be busy all day? Oliver amended. Yes, he said sharply, I am. What if we went on a nature walk? Amanda suggested. I can't, he said, even though part of him wanted to. But the twins were so vexing, and they were sure to force him to lose. His temper, and nothing terrified him more. We could help you in the greenhouse, Oliver said. Destroy, it was more like it. No, Philip said, he honestly didn't think he could answer to his temper if they ruined his work. But. I can't, he snapped, hating the tone of his voice. But. And who is this, came a voice from behind him. He turned around. It was Eloise Bridgerton, sticking her nose into what was assuredly not her business and this after arriving. On his doorstep, without even so much as a hint of warning. I beg your pardon, he said to her, not bothering to hide the irritation in his voice. She ignored him and faced the twins. And who might you be, she asked. Who are you? Oliver demanded. Amanda's eyes narrowed into slits. Philip allowed himself his first true grin of the morning and crossed his arms. Yes, let's see how Miss Bridgerton handled this. I am Miss Bridgerton, she said. You're not our new governess, are you? Oliver asked, with suspicion bordering on venom. Heavens, no, she replied. What happened to your last governess? Philip coughed. Loudly. The twins took the hint. Air, nothing, Oliver said. Miss Bridgerton didn't look the least bit fooled by the air of innocence the twins were trying to convey, but she wisely did not choose to pursue the subject, and instead just said, I am your guest. The twins pondered that for a moment, and then Amanda said, we don't want any guests, followed by Oliver's, we don't need any guests. Children. Philip interjected, not really wanting to take Miss Bridgerton's side after she'd been so meddlesome, but really. Having no other choice. He couldn't let his children be so rude. The twins crossed their arms in unison and gave Miss Bridgerton the cut direct. That's it, Philip boomed. You will apologize to Miss Bridgerton at once. They stared at her mutinously. Now, he roared. Sorry, they mumbled, but no one could ever have mistaken them for meaning it. Back to your room, the both of you, Philip said sharply. They marched off like a pair of proud soldiers, noses in the air. It would have been quite an impressive sight if Amanda hadn't turned around at the bottom of the stairs and stuck out her tongue. Amanda, he bellowed, striding toward her. She tore up the stairs with the speed of a fox. Philip held himself very still for several moments, his hands fisted and shaking at his sides. Just once once. He would like his children to behave and mind and not answer a question with a question and be polite to guests and not stick out their tongues, and just once, he'd like to feel that he was a good father, that he knew what he was doing, and not raise his voice. He hated when he raised his voice, hated the flash of terror he thought he saw in their eyes, hated the memories it brought back for him. Sir Philip? Miss Bridgerton. Damn, he'd almost forgotten she was there. 
he turned around. Yes, he asked, mortified that she'd witnessed his humiliation, which of course made him irritated with her. Your butler brought the tea tray, she said, motioning to the drawing room. He gave her a curt nod. He needed to get outside. Away from his children, away from the woman who'd seen what a terrible father he was to them. It had started to rain, but he didn't care. I hope you enjoy your breakfast, he said. I will see you after you have rested. And then he made haste out the door, making his way to his greenhouse, where he could be alone with his non-speaking, non-misbehaving, non-medleesome plants. Chapter 3 You will see why I could not accept his suit. He was too churlish by half and positively possessed of a foul temper. I should like to marry someone gracious and considerate who treats me like a queen. Or at the very least, a princess. Surely that is not too much to ask. From Eloise Bridgerton to her dear friend Penelope Featherington, sent by messenger after Eloise received her first proposal of marriage. By afternoon, Eloise was almost convinced that she had made a terrible mistake. And in truth, the sole reason she was only almost convinced was that the only thing she hated more than making mistakes was the admission thereof. So she was trying to maintain a proverbial stiff upper lip and forcing herself to pretend that this ghastly situation might all work itself out in the end. She had been left stunned open-mouthed, even when Sir Philip had departed with barely more than an enjoy your food, and then stalked out the door. She had traveled halfway across England answering his invitation to come and visit, and he left her alone in the drawing room a mere half hour after she arrived? She hadn't expected him to fall in love at first sight and drop to his knees, professing his undying devotion, but she'd hoped for a little bit more than a curt, who are you, and enjoy your food, or maybe she had expected him to fall in love at the first sight of her. She'd built an elaborate dream around her image of this man an image which she now knew to be untrue. She'd let herself mold him into the perfect man, and it hurt so much. To learn that he wasn't just imperfect, he was quite close to abysmal. And the worst was she had only herself to blame. Sir Philip had never misrepresented himself in his letters, although she did think he ought to have mentioned that he was a father, especially before he'd proposed marriage. Her dreams had been just that dreams. Wishful illusions, all of her own making. If he wasn't what she'd expected, that was her fault. She'd been expecting something that didn't even exist. And she should have known better. What's more, he didn't seem to be a very good father, which was as black a mark as anyone could get in her book. No, she wasn't being fair. She shouldn't judge him so quickly on that score. The children didn't look ill-treated or malnourished or anything so dire, but Sir Philip clearly had no idea how to manage them. He had handled them all wrong this morning, and it was clear from the way they behaved that his relationship with them was distant at best. Good heavens, they had practically begged him to spend the day with them. Any child who actually received enough attention from his parents would never act in such a way. Eloise and her siblings had spent half their childhood trying to avoid their parents' lack of supervision being, of course, more conducive for mischief. Her own father had been splendid. She had been only seven when he'd died, but she remembered him well, from the stories. He wove at bedtime to the hikes they had taken across the fields of Kent, sometimes with all the Bridgertons in tow, sometimes just with one lucky child, chosen for some special alone time with father. It was clear to her that if she hadn't suggested to Sir Philip that he find out why his children were screaming and knocking over the furniture, he would have left them to their own devices. Or, more to the point, left them to be someone else's problem. And by the end of their conversation, it was apparent that Sir Philip's main aim in life was to avoid his children, which Eloise did not approve of at all. She pushed herself off of her bed forcing herself upright even though she was bone-tired. But every time she laid down, something began to quicken in her lungs, and she felt herself gasping in that awful precursor to not just tears, but true, body-shaking sobs. If she didn't get up and do something, she wasn't going to be able to control herself. And she didn't think she could bear herself if she cried. 
She wrenched the window open, even though it was still gray and drizzling outside. There was no wind, so the rain ought not to blow in, and what she really needed right now was a bit of fresh air. A slap of cold on her face might not make her feel better, but it certainly wasn't going to make her feel worse. From her window, she could see Sir Philip's greenhouse. She assumed that was where he was, since she hadn't heard him here. In the house, stomping about and bellowing at his children. The glass was fogged up and the only thing she could see was a blurry curtain of green his beloved plants, she supposed. What sort of man was he, that he preferred plants to people? Certainly not anyone who appreciated a fine conversation. She felt her shoulder sag. Eloise had spent half her life in search of a fine conversation. And if he was such a hermit, why had he bothered to write her back? He had worked just as hard as she had to perpetuate their correspondence. Not to mention his proposal. If he hadn't wanted company, he had no business inviting her here. She took a few deep breaths of the misty air and then forced herself to stand up straight. She wasn't certain what she was expected to do with herself all day. She'd taken a nap already, exhaustion had quickly won out over misery. But no one had. Come by to inform her of lunch or of any other plans that might extend to her as a house guest. If she stayed here, in this slightly drab and drafty room, she was going to go mad, or at the very least cry herself into oblivion, which was something she did not tolerate in others, so the thought of doing it herself was horrifying. There was no reason she couldn't explore the house a bit, was there? And maybe she could find herself some food along the way. She'd eaten all four muffins on the tea tray this morning, all with as much butter and marmalade as she could politely slather on, but she was still famished. At this point, she thought she might be willing to commit violence for a ham sandwich. She changed her clothing, donning a dress of peach muslin that was pretty and feminine without being too frilly. And most importantly, it was easy to get on and off, surely a critical factor when one had run from home without a lady's maid. A quick glance in the mirror told her that she looked presentable, if no picture of ravishing beauty and so she stepped out into the hall, only to be immediately confronted by the eight-year-old Crane twins, looking very much as if they'd been lying in wait for hours. Good afternoon, Eloise said, waiting for them to come to their feet. How nice of you to greet me. We're not here to greet you, Amanda blurted out, grunting when Oliver elbowed her in the ribs. You're not? Eloise asked, trying to sound surprised. Are you here? then, to show me to the dining room? I'm quite hungry, I must say. No, Oliver said, crossing his arms. Not even that? Eloise mused. Let me guess. You're here to take me to your room and show me your toys. No, they said, in unison. Then it must be to take me on a tour of the house. It's quite large and I might lose my way. No. No? You wouldn't want me to lose my way, would you? No, Amanda said. I mean yes. Eloise feigned incomprehension. You want me to lose my way? Amanda nodded. Oliver just tightened his arms across his chest and speared her with a sullen stare. Hmm. That's interesting, but it hardly explains your presence right here outside my door, does it? I'm not likely to get. Lost in the company of you two. Their lips parted in befuddled surprise. You do know your way around the house, don't you? Of course, Oliver grunted, followed by Amanda's, we're not babies. No, I can see that, Eloise said with a thoughtful nod. Babies wouldn't be allowed to wait by themselves outside my door, after all. They'd be quite busy with nappies and bottles and the like. They had nothing to add to that. Does your father know you're here? He's busy. Very busy. He's a very busy man. Much too busy for you. Eloise watched and listened with interest as the twins shot off their lightning-fast statements, falling all over themselves to demonstrate how busy Sir Philip was. So what you're telling me, Eloise said, is that your father is busy. They stared at her, momentarily dumbfounded by her calm retelling of the facts, then nodded. But that still doesn't explain your presence, Eloise mused, 
because I don't think your father sent you here in his stead. She waited until they shook their heads in the negative, then added, unless. I know, she said in an excited voice, allowing herself a mental smile over her cleverness. She had nine nephews and nieces, she knew exactly how to talk to children. You're here to tell me you have magical powers and can predict the weather. No, they said, but Eloise heard a giggle. No? That's a shame, because this constant drizzle is miserable, don't you think? No, Amanda said, quite forcefully, father likes the rain, and so do we. He likes the rain? Eloise asked in surprise. How very odd. No, it's not, Oliver replied, his stance defensive. My father isn't odd. He's perfect. Don't say mean things about him. I didn't, Eloise replied, wondering what on earth was going on now. At first, she'd merely thought the twins were here to frighten her away. Presumably, they had heard that their father was thinking of marrying her and wanted no part of a stepmother, especially given the stories Eloise had been told by the housemaid of the succession of poor, abused governesses who had come and gone. But if that were the simple truth, wouldn't they want her to think there was something wrong with Sir Philip? If they wanted her gone, wouldn't they be trying to convince her that he would be a terrible candidate for marriage? I assure you, I harbor no ill will toward any of you, Eloise said. In fact, I barely know your father. If you make father sad, I will. I will. Eloise watched the poor little boy's face grow red with frustration as he fought for words and bravado. Carefully, gently, she crouched next to him until her face was on a level with his and said, Oliver, I promise you, I am not here to make your father sad. He said nothing, so she turned to his twin and asked, Amanda? You need to go, Amanda blurted out, her arms crossed so tightly that her face was turning red. We don't want you here. Well, I'm not going anywhere, for at least a week, Eloise told M.E.M., keeping her voice firm. The children needed sympathy, and probably a great deal of love as well, but they also needed a bit of discipline and a clear idea of who was in charge. And then, out of nowhere, Oliver hurled himself forward and pushed her hard, with both hands against her chest. Her balance was precarious, crouching as she was on the balls of her feet. Eloise toppled over backward, landing most. Inelegantly on her bottom and rolling back until she was quite certain the twins had received a nice look at her petticoats. Well, she declared, rising to her feet and crossing her arms as she stared sternly down at them. They had both taken several steps back and were staring at her with a mixture of glee and horror, as if they couldn't quite believe that one of them had had the nerve to push her over. That, Eloise continued, was inadvisable. Are you going to hit us? Oliver asked. His voice was defiant, but there was a hint of fright there, as if someone had hit them before. Of course not, Eloise said quickly. I don't believe in striking children. I don't believe in striking anyone, except people who strike children, she added to herself. They looked somewhat relieved to hear it. I might remind you, however, Eloise continued, that you struck me first. I pushed you, he corrected. She allowed herself a tiny groan. She ought to have anticipated that one. If you do not want people striking you, you ought. To practice the same philosophy, the golden rule, Amanda piped up. Exactly, Eloise said with a wide smile. She rather doubted she'd changed the course of their lives with one little lesson, but nonetheless it was nice to hope that something she'd said provoked some consideration. But doesn't that mean, Amanda said thoughtfully, that you should go home? Eloise felt her small moment of elation crumbling to dust, as she tried to imagine what leap of logic Amanda was about to embark upon to explain why Eloise should be banished to the Amazon. We're home, Amanda said, sounding exceedingly supercilious for an eight-year-old. Or maybe she was supercilious as only an eight-year-old could be. So you should go home. It doesn't work that way, Eloise said sharply. Yes, it does, Amanda replied with a smug little nod. Do unto others as you would like done to you. We haven't gone to your house, so you shouldn't come to ours. You're very clever, 
Did you know that? Eloise asked. Amanda looked as if she wanted to nod, but she was clearly too suspicious of Eloise's compliment to accept it. Eloise bent down so that they were face to face, all three of them. But I, she said to them in a very serious and slightly defiant voice, am very clever, too. They stared at her with wide eyes, their mouths hanging slack as they regarded this person who was clearly so different from any other adult they'd ever met. Do we understand each other? Eloise asked, straightening her spine and smoothing her hands along her skirts in a deceptively casual manner. They said nothing, so she decided to answer for them. Good, she said. Now, then, would you like to show me where the dining room is? I'm famished. We have lessons, Oliver said. You do? Eloise asked, arching her brows. How interesting. Then you must return to them at once. I imagine you've fallen behind after spending so long waiting outside my door. How did you know Amanda's question was cut short by Oliver's elbow in her ribs? I have seven brothers and sisters, Eloise answered, deciding that Amanda's question deserved an answer, even if her brother hadn't allowed her to finish her sentence. There isn't much about this sort of warfare that I don't already know. But as the twins scurried down the hall, Eloise was left chewing her lower lip in apprehension. She had a feeling she shouldn't have ended their encounter with such a challenge. She had practically dared Oliver and Amanda to find a way to evict her from the premises. And while she was quite certain they wouldn't succeed, she was a Bridgerton, after all, and made of sterner stuff than those. Two even knew existed, she had a feeling that they would throw every fiber of their being into the task. Eloise shuddered. Eels in the bed, hair dipped in ink, jam on chairs. It had all been done to her at one point or another and she didn't particularly relish a repeat performance, and certainly not by a pair of children twenty years her junior. She sighed, wondering what it was she had gotten herself into. She had better find Sir Philip and get to the task of deciding whether they would suit, because if she really was leaving in a week or two, never to see any of the cranes again, she wasn't sure that she wanted to put herself through the trouble of mice and spiders and salt in the sugar bowl. Her stomach rumbled. Whether it was the thought of salt or sugar that did it, Eloise didn't know. But it was definitely time to find something to eat. And better sooner than later, before the twins had a chance to figure out how to poison her food. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Philip knew that he'd blundered badly. But Doucet, the bloody woman had given him no warning, if she'd only alerted him. Of her arrival, he could have prepared himself thought of a few poetic things to say. Did she really think he'd scribbled all those letters without laboring over every word? He'd never send out the first draft of any of his missives, although he always wrote it on his best paper, each time hoping that this would be the time he'd get it right on the first try. Hell, if she'd given him warning, he might have even summoned a romantic gesture or two. Flowers would have been nice, and heaven knew, if there was one thing he was good at, it was flowers. But instead, she'd simply appeared before him as if conjured from a dream, and he'd mucked everything up. And it hadn't helped that Miss Eloise Bridgerton was not what he had expected. She was a 28-year-old spinster, for heaven's sake. She was supposed to be unattractive. Horse-faced, even. Instead. She was. Well, he wasn't exactly certain how one could describe her. Not beautiful, precisely, but still somehow stunning with thick chestnut hair and eyes of the clearest, crispest gray. She was the sort of woman whose expressions made her beautiful. There was intelligence in her eyes, curiosity in the way she cocked her head to the side. Her features were unique, almost exotic, with her heart-shaped face and wide smile. Not that he'd seen much of that smile. His less-than-legendary charm had seen to that. He jammed his hands into a pile of moist soil and scooped some into a small clay pot, leaving it loosely packed for optimal root growth. What the devil was he going to do now? He'd pinned his hopes on his mirage of Miss Eloise Bridgerton, based upon the letters she'd sent to him over the past year. He didn't have time, nor, in truth, the inclination, to court a prospective mother. For the twins, so it had seemed perfect, not to mention almost easy, to woo her through letters. 
Surely an unmarried woman rapidly approaching the age of 30 would be gratified to receive a proposal of marriage. He hadn't expected her to accept his offer without meeting with him, of course, and he wasn't prepared to formally commit to the idea without making her acquaintance either. But he had expected that she would be someone who was at least a little bit desperate for a husband. Instead, she'd arrived looking young and pretty and smart and self-confident, and good God, but why would a woman like that want to marry someone she didn't even know? Not to mention tie herself to a decidedly rural estate in the farthest corner of Gloucestershire. Philip might know less than nothing about fashion, but even he could tell that her garments had been well, made and most probably of the latest style. She was going to expect trips to London and active social life, friends none of which she was likely to find here at Romney Hall. It seemed almost useless to even try to make her acquaintance. She wasn't going to stay, and he'd be foolish to get his hopes up. He groaned, then cursed, for good measure. Now he was going to have to court some other woman. Curse it, now he was going. To have to find some other woman to court, which was going to be nearly as difficult, no one in the district would even look at. Him. All of the unmarried ladies knew about the twins, and there wasn't a one of them willing to take on the responsibility of his little devils. He'd pinned all of his hopes on Miss Bridgerton, and now it seemed that he was going to have to give up on her as well. He set his pot down too hard on a shelf, wincing as the clatter of it rang through the greenhouse. With a loud sigh, he dumped his muddy hands into a bucket of already dirted water to wash them off. He'd been rude this morning. He was still rather irritated that she'd come out here and wasted his time or if she hadn't wasted it yet, she was almost certainly going to waste it, since she wasn't likely to turn around and leave this evening. But that didn't excuse his behavior, it wasn't her fault he couldn't manage his own children, and it certainly wasn't her fault. That this failing always put him in a foul mood. Wiping his hands on a towel he kept by the door, he strode out into the drizzle and made his way to the house. It was probably time for luncheon, and it wouldn't hurt anyone to sit down with her at the table and make polite conversation. Plus, she was here. After all his effort with the letters, it seemed foolish not to at least see if they might get on well enough for marriage. Only an idiot would send her packing or allow her to leave without even ascertaining her suitability. It was unlikely that she would stay, but not, he reckoned, impossible, and he might at least give it a try. He made his way through the misty drizzle and into the house, wiping his feet on the mat that the housekeeper always left out. For him near the side entrance. He was a mess, as he always was after working in the greenhouse, and the servants were used to him in such a state, but he supposed he ought to clean up before finding Miss Bridgerton and inviting her to eat with him. She was from London and would surely object to sitting at table with a man who was less than perfectly groomed. He cut through the kitchen, nodding genially at a maid washing carrots in a tub of water. The servant's stairs were just outside. The other kitchen door and Miss Bridgerton, he said in surprise. She was sitting at a table in the kitchen, halfway through a very large ham sandwich, and looking remarkably at home on her perch on a stool. What are you doing here? Sir Philip, she said, nodding at him. You don't have to eat in the kitchen, he said, scowling at her, for no reason other than that she was not where he'd expected her to be, that and the fact that he'd actually intended to change his clothes for lunch something with which he did not ordinarily bother, for her benefit, and here she'd caught him a mess, anyway. I know, she replied, cocking her head and blinking those devastating gray eyes at him, but I was looking for food and company, and this seemed the best place to find both. Was that an insult? He couldn't be certain, and her eyes looked innocent, so he decided to ignore it and said, I was just on my way to change into cleaner attire and invite you to share my lunch with me. I would be happy to remove myself to the breakfast room and finish my sandwich there, if you wish to join me, Eloise said. I'm sure Mrs. Smith wouldn't mind making another sandwich for you. This one is delicious. She looked over at the cook. Mrs. Smith? It's no trouble at all, Miss Bridgerton, the cook said, leaving Philip nearly gaping at her. 
It was quite the friendliest tone of voice he had ever heard emerge from her lips. Eloise edged herself off of her stool and picked up her plate. Shall we, she said to Philip, I have no objection to your attire. Before he even realized that he had not agreed to her plan, Philip found himself in the breakfast room, seated across from her. At the small round table, he used far more often than the long, lonely one in the formal dining room. A maid had carried Miss Bridgerton's tea service, and after inquiring if he wanted some, Miss Bridgerton herself had expertly prepared him a cup. It was an unsettling feeling, this. She had maneuvered him quite neatly to serve her purposes, and somehow it didn't quite matter that he'd intended to ask her to lunch with him in this very manner. He liked to think he was at least nominally in charge in his own home. I met your children earlier, Miss Bridgerton said, lifting her teacup to her lips. Yes, I was there, he replied, pleased that she had initiated the conversation. Now he didn't have to. No, she corrected, after that. He looked up in question. They were waiting for me, she explained, outside my bedchamber door. An awful feeling began to churn and roll in his stomach, waiting for her with what? A bag of live frogs? A bag of dead frogs? His children had not been kind to their governesses, and he did not imagine they'd be much more charitable to a female guest who was obviously there in the role of prospective stepmother. He coughed, I trust you survived the encounter? Oh, yes, she said. We have reached an understanding of sorts. An understanding? He eyed her warily. Of sorts? She waved away his question as she chewed on her food. You needn't worry about me. Need I worry about my children? She looked up at him with an inscrutable smile. Of course not. Very well. He looked down at the sandwich that had been placed in front of him and took a healthy bite. Once he'd swallowed, he looked her straight in the eye and said, I must apologize for my greeting this morning. I was less than gracious. She nodded regally. And I apologize for arriving unheralded. It was quite ill-bred of me. He nodded back. You, however, apologized for that this morning, while I did not. She offered him a smile, a genuine one, and he felt his heart lurch. Good God, when she smiled it transformed her entire face. In all the time he'd been corresponding with her, he'd never dreamed that she would take his breath away. Thank you, she murmured, her cheeks flushing with the barest hint of pink. That was very gracious of you. Philip cleared his throat and shifted uneasily in his seat. What was wrong with him, that he was less comfortable with her? Smiles than he was with her frowns? Right, he said, coughing one more time to cover the gruffness in his voice. Now that we have that out of the way, perhaps we should address your reason for being here. Eloise set her sandwich down and regarded him with obvious surprise. Clearly, she hadn't expected him to be so direct. You are interested in marriage, she said. Are you? he countered. I'm here, she said simply. He looked at her assessingly, his eyes searching hers until she squirmed in her seat. You are not what I expected, Miss Bridgerton. Under the circumstances, I would not think it inappropriate for you to use my given name, she said and you are not what I expected, either. He sat back in his seat, looking at her with the vaguest hint of a smile. And what did you expect? What did you expect? Eloise countered. He gave her a look that told her he'd noticed she'd avoided his question, then said, quite bluntly, I didn't expect you to be so pretty. Eloise felt herself lurch back slightly at the unexpected compliment. She hadn't been looking her best that morning and even. If she had well, she'd never been considered one of the beauties of the ton. Bridgerton women were generally thought to be attractive, vivacious, and personable. She and her sisters were popular, and they'd all received more than one offer of marriage, but men seemed to like them because they liked them, not because they were struck dumb by their beauty. I, ah. Uh. She felt herself flushing, which mortified her, which of course caused her cheeks to redden even more. Thank you. He nodded graciously. 
I am not certain why my appearance would have come as a surprise to you, she said, thoroughly annoyed with herself for reacting so strongly to his flattery. Heavens, one would think she had never been paid a compliment before. But he was just sitting there, looking at her, looking and staring, and she shivered. And it wasn't the least bit drafty. Could one shiver from feeling too hot? You yourself wrote that you are a spinster, he said. There must be some reason you have never married. It was not because I received no offers, she felt compelled to inform him. Obviously not, he said, tilting his head in her direction as a gesture of compliment, but I cannot help but be curious as to why a woman like you would feel the need to resort to, well, me. She looked at him, really looked at him, for the first time since she'd arrived. He was quite handsome in a rough, slightly unkempt sort of way. His dark hair looked in dire need of a good trim, and his skin showed signs of a faint tan, which was impressive considering how little sunshine they'd enjoyed lately. He was large and muscular, and sat in his chair with a careless, athletic sort of grace, legs sprawled in a manner that would not have been acceptable in a London drawing room. And the look on his face told her that he didn't much care that his manners were not de rigueur. It wasn't the same sort of defiant attitude she saw so often among young men of the ton. She'd met so many men of that kind the ones who made such a point of defying convention, and then spoiled the effect by going out of their way to make sure that everyone knew how daring and scandalous they were. But with Sir Philip it was different. Eloise would have bet good money that it would simply never have occurred to him to care that he wasn't sitting in a properly formal manner and it certainly wouldn't have occurred to him to make sure that other people knew he didn't care. It made Eloise wonder if that was the mark of a truly self-confident person, and if so, why did he need to resort to her? Because from what she'd seen of him, Kurt Manners this morning aside, he shouldn't have had too much trouble finding himself a wife. I am here, she said, finally remembering that he had asked her a question because after refusing several offers of marriage she knew that a better person would have been more modest and not taken such pains to emphasize the word several, but she just couldn't help herself I find that I still desire a husband, your letter seemed to indicate that you might be a good candidate. It seemed short-sighted not to meet with you and find out if that was indeed true. He nodded. Very practical of you. What about you? she countered. You were the one who initially brought up the topic of marriage. Why couldn't you simply find yourself a wife among the women here? For a moment he did nothing but blink, looking at her as if he couldn't quite believe she hadn't figured it out for herself. Finally, he said, you've met my children. Eloise nearly choked on the bite of sandwich she just started to chew. I beg your pardon? My children, he said flatly. You've met them. Twice, I think. You told me so. Yes, but what? She felt her eyes grow wide. Oh, no, don't tell me they've scared away every prospective wife in the district? The look he leveled at her was grim. Most of the women in the area refuse to even enter the ranks of the prospectives. She scoffed. They're not that bad. They need a mother, he said baldly. She raised her brows. Surely you can find a more romantic way to convince me to be your wife. Philip sighed wearily, running a hand through his already ruffled hair. Miss Bridgerton, he said, then corrected himself with Eloise. I'm going to be honest with you, because, to be frank, I have neither the energy nor the patience for fancy romantic words or cleverly constructed stories. I need a wife. My children need a mother. I invited you here to see if you would be willing to assume such a role, and indeed, if you and I would suit. Which one, she whispered. He clenched his hands, his knuckles, brushing the tablecloth. What was it about women? Did they speak in some sort of code? Which one, what, he asked, impatience coloring his voice. Which one do you want, she clarified, her voice still soft. A wife or a mother? Both, he said. I should think that was obvious. Which one do you want more? Philip stared at her for a long while, aware that this was an important question.
quite possibly one that could signal the end of his unusual courtship. Finally, he just offered her a helpless shrug and said, I'm sorry, but I don't know how to separate the two. She nodded, her eyes serious. I see, she murmured. I expect you are right. Philip let out a long breath he wasn't even aware he'd been holding, somehow God himself only knew how he'd answered correctly. Or at the very least, not incorrectly, Eloise fidgeted slightly in her seat, then motioned to the half-eaten sandwich on his plate. Shall we continue with our meal, she suggested. You've been in your greenhouse all morning. I'm sure you must be quite famished. Philip nodded and took a bite of his food, all of a sudden feeling quite pleased with life. He still wasn't certain that Miss Bridgerton was going to consent to become Lady Crane, but if she did, well, he didn't think he would have any objections. But wooing her wasn't going to be as easy as he'd anticipated. It was clear to him that he needed her more than the other way around. He'd been counting on her being a desperate spinster, which was clearly not the case, despite her advanced years. Miss Bridgerton, he suspected, had a number of options in her life, of which he was only one. But still, something must have compelled her to leave her home and travel all the way out to Gloucestershire. If her life in London was so perfect, why, then, had she left? But as he watched her across the table, watched her face transform with a mere smile, it occurred to him he didn't much care why she'd left. He just needed to make sure that she stayed. Chapter 4 So sorry to hear that Caroline is colicky and giving you fits. And of course it is too bad that neither Amelia nor Belinda is amenable to her arrival but you must look upon the bright side, dear Daphne. It would all have been so much more difficult had you birthed twins. From Eloise Bridgerton to her. Sister the Duchess of Hastings, one month after the birth of Daphne's third child, Philip whistled to himself as he walked through the main hall toward the staircase, inordinately pleased with his life. He'd spent the better part of the afternoon in the company of Miss Bridgerton No, Eloise, he reminded himself and he was now convinced she'd make an excellent wife. She was quite clearly intelligent, and with all those brothers and sisters, not to mention nephews and nieces, she'd told him about, surely she'd know how to manage Oliver and Amanda. And, he thought with a wolfish smile, she was rather pretty, and more than once this afternoon, he'd caught himself looking at her, wondering how she'd feel in his arms, whether she'd respond to his kiss. His body tightened at the thought. It had been so long since he'd been with a woman. More years than he cared to count. More years, quite honestly, than any man would care to admit to. He'd not availed himself of any of the services offered by the barmaids at the local public inn, preferring his women more freshly washed and, in truth, not quite so anonymous. Or maybe more anonymous, none of those barmaids were likely to leave the village during their lifetime and Philip enjoyed his time at the public inn too much to ruin it by constantly having to run into women with whom he'd once lain and no longer cared to. And before Marina's death well, he'd never even considered being unfaithful to her, despite the fact that they'd not shared a bed since the twins were quite young. She'd been so melancholy following their birth. Marina had always seemed fragile and overly pensive. But it was only after Oliver and Amanda had arrived that she'd sunk into her own world of sorrow and despair. It had been horrifying for Philip, watching the life behind her eyes slip away, day by day, until all that was left was an eerie flatness, the barest shadow of the woman who had once existed. He knew that women couldn't have relations immediately following childbirth, but even once she was physically healed he couldn't have even imagined forcing himself upon her. How was one supposed to lust after a woman who always looked as if she might cry? When the twins were a bit older, and Philip had thought hoped, really that Marina was getting better, he had visited her in her bedchamber. Once. She had not refused him, but nor had she taken part in his lovemaking. She'd just lain there, doing nothing, her head turned to the side, her eyes open, barely blinking. It was almost as if she hadn't been there at all. He'd left feeling soiled, morally corrupt, as if he'd somehow violated her, even though she had never uttered the word no. And he had never touched her again. His needs weren't so great that he needed to slake them upon a woman who lay beneath him like a corpse. And he never wanted to feel again as he had that final night. Once he'd returned to his own room, 
He'd promptly emptied the contents of his stomach, shaking and trembling, disgusted with himself. He had behaved like an animal, desperately trying to rouse in her some sort any sort of response. When that had proven impossible, he'd grown angry with her, wanted to punish her, and that had terrified him. He'd been too rough. He didn't think he'd hurt her, but he hadn't been gentle. And he never wanted to see that side of himself again. But Marina was gone. Gone. And Eloise was different. She wasn't going to cry at the drop of a hat or shut herself in her room, picking at her food and crying into her pillow. Eloise had spirit. Backbone. Eloise was happy. And if that wasn't a good criterion for a wife, he didn't know what was. He paused at the base of the stairs to check his pocket watch. He had told Eloise that supper would be at seven and that he would meet her outside her door to take her down to the dining room. He didn't want to be early and appear too eager. On the other hand, it wouldn't do to be late. There was little to be gained in making her think he was disinterested. He snapped his watch shut and rolled his eyes. He was behaving no better than a green boy. This was ridiculous. He was master of his own house and an accomplished scientist. He ought not to be counting minutes just so he could best win a woman's favor. But even as he thought that, he opened his watch for one more check. Three minutes prior to seven. Excellent. That would give him just enough time to ascend the stairs and meet her outside her door with precisely one minute to spare. He grinned, enjoying his warm flush of desire at the thought of her in an evening gown. He hoped it was blue. She would look lovely in blue. His smile deepened, she would look lovely in nothing at all. Except when he found her, upstairs in the hall outside her bedchamber, her hair had gone white. As, it seemed, had the rest of her. Bloody hell. Oliver, he bellowed. Amanda. Oh, they're long gone, Eloise bit off. She looked up at him with fuming eyes. Fuming eyes which, he couldn't help but note, were the only part of her not covered with a remarkably thick coating of flour. Well, good for her for closing them in time. He'd always admired quick reflexes in a woman. Miss Bridgerton, he said, his hand moving forward to help her then retracting as he realized there was no helping her. I cannot begin to express. Don't apologize for them, she snapped. Right, he said. Of course. But I promise you. I will. His words trailed off. Truly, the look in her eyes would have been enough to silence Napoleon himself. Sir Philip, she said, slowly, tightly, looking very much as if she might launch herself at him in a furious frenzy. As you can see, I'm not quite ready for supper. He took a self-preservational step back. I gather the twins paid you a visit, he said. Oh, yes, she replied, with no small measure of sarcasm. And then scampered away. The little cowards themselves are nowhere to be found. Well, they wouldn't be far, he mused allowing her the well-deserved insult to his children while he tried to carry on a conversation as if she didn't look like some sort of hideous ghostly apparition. Somehow it seemed the best course of action. Or at the very least, the one least likely to result in her wrapping her fingers around his throat. They'd want to see the results, of course, he said, taking another discreet step back as she coughed, sending up a swirling cloud of flour. I don't suppose you heard any laughter when the flour came down? Cackling, perhaps? She glared at him. Right. He winced. Sorry for that. Stupid joke. It was difficult, she said, so tightly he wondered if her jaw might snap, to hear anything but the sound of the bucket hitting my head. Damn, he muttered, following her line of sight until his eyes fell on a large metal bucket lying on its side on the carpet, with a small amount of flour still inside. Are you hurt? She shook her head. He reached out and took her head in his hands, trying to inspect her skin for bumps or bruises. Sir Philip, she yelped, attempting to squirm out of his grasp. I must ask you to. Be still, he ordered, smoothing his thumbs over her temples, feeling for welts. It was an intimate gesture, and one he found oddly satisfying. She seemed just the right height next to him. 
and had she been clean, he wasn't sure he'd have been able to stop himself from leaning down and dropping a soft kiss on her brow. I'm fine, she practically grunted, wrenching herself free. The flower weighed more than the bucket. Philip leaned down and righted the bucket, testing its weight in his hand. It was fairly light and shouldn't have caused too much damage, but still, it wasn't the sort of thing with which one wanted to be struck on the head. I shall survive, I assure you, she bit out. He cleared his throat. I imagine you will want a bath, he thought she said, I imagine I will want those two little wretches on the end of a rope, but the words came out under her breath, and just because that was what he would have said well, it didn't mean she was as uncharitably inclined. I'll have one drawn for you, he said quickly, don't bother. The water from my last bath is still in the tub. He winced. His children's timing couldn't have been more on the spot. Nonetheless, he said hastily, I shall see that it is warmed with a few fresh buckets. He winced again at her glare. Bad choice of words. I'll just see to that now, he said. I'll just see to that now, he said. Yes, she replied tautly. Do that. He strode down the hall to give the order to a maid, except that the minute he turned the corner, he saw that a half-dozen servants were already gaping at them, and had in fact set up a betting pool on how long the twins would last before Philip tanned their hides. After sending them on their way with instructions to draw a new bath immediately, he returned to Eloise's side. He was already dusted with flour, so he saw no harm in taking her hand. I'm terribly sorry, he murmured, now trying not to laugh. His immediate reaction had been fury, but now, well, she did look rather ridiculous. She glared at him, clearly sensing his change of mood. He quickly assumed a sober mien. Perhaps you should return to your room, he suggested. And sit where, she snapped. She had a point. She was likely to ruin anything she touched, or at the very least necessitate a thorough cleaning. I'll just keep you company, then, he said, trying to sound jovial. She gave him a look that was decidedly unamused. Right, he said, in an attempt to fill the silence with something other than flour. He glanced up over the door, impressed with the twins' handiwork, despite the unfortunate results. I wonder how they did it, he mused. Her mouth fell open. Does it matter? Well, he said, seeing from her face that this was not the most advisable avenue of conversation, but continuing nonetheless with, I certainly can't condone their actions, but it was obviously quite cleverly done. I don't see where they attached the bucket, and they rested it on the top of the door. I beg your pardon? I have seven brothers and sisters, she said dismissively. Do you think I've never seen this prank before? They opened the door just a crack and then carefully placed the bucket. And you didn't hear them? She glared at him. Right, he said hastily. You were in the bath. I don't suppose, she said in a haughty voice, that you intend to imply that this was my fault for not having heard them. Of course not, he said very quickly. Judging from the murderous look in Miss Bridgerton's eyes. He was fairly certain that his health and welfare were directly dependent upon the speed with which he agreed with her. Why don't I leave you to your... Was there really a good way to describe the process of cleaning several pounds of flour off one's person? Will I see you at supper? He asked, deciding that a change of subject was most definitely in order. She nodded, once, briefly. There wasn't a great deal of warmth in that nod, but Philip reckoned he should be happy that she wasn't planning to leave the county that night. I will instruct the cook to keep supper warm, he said. And I will see to punishing the twins. No, she said, halting him in his tracks, leave them to me. He turned around slowly, a bit unnerved by the tone of her voice. What, precisely, do you plan to do with them, with them, or to them? Philip had never thought the day would come when he'd be frightened by a woman, but as God was his witness, Eloise Bridgerton scared the living wits out of him. The look in her eyes was positively diabolical. Miss Bridgerton, he said, crossing his arms, I must ask. What do you intend to do to my children? I'm pondering my options. He considered that. May I depend upon their still being alive tomorrow morning? Oh, yes, she replied. 
alive, and with every limb intact, I assure you. Philip stared at her for several moments, then let his lips spread into a slow, satisfied smile. He had a feeling that Eloise Bridgerton's vengeance, whatever it might be, would be exactly what his children needed. Surely anyone with seven brothers and sisters would know how to wreak havoc in the most cunning, underhanded, and ingenious manner. Very well, Miss Bridgerton, he said, almost glad they'd dumped a bucket of flour on her. They are all yours. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. An hour later, just after he and Eloise sat down for supper, the screaming began. Philip actually dropped his spoon, Amanda's shrieks had a more terrified tenor than usual. Eloise didn't even pause as she placed a spoonful of turtle soup between her lips. She's fine, she murmured, delicately wiping her mouth with her serviette. The rapid patter of little feet thundered overhead, signaling that Amanda was racing toward the steps. Philip half rose in his seat. Perhaps I should. I put a fish in her bed, Miss Bridgerton said, not quite smiling, but nonetheless looking rather pleased with herself. A fish, he echoed. Very well, it was a rather big fish. The tadpole in his mind quickly grew into a toothy shark, and he found himself choking on air. Air, he couldn't help but ask, where did you find a fish? Mrs. Smith, she said, as if his cook handed out large trout every day of the week. He forced himself to sit back down. He wasn't going to run to save Amanda. He wanted to, he did possess, the odd paternal instinct, after all, and she was shrieking as if the fires of hell were licking at her toes. But his daughter had made her bed, now it was time to lie in the one Miss Bridgerton had stunk up for her. He dipped his spoon in his soup, lifted it a few inches, then paused. And what did you place in Oliver's bed? Nothing. He quirked a brow in question. It will keep him in suspense, she explained coolly. Philip cocked his head toward her in salute. She was good. They'll retaliate, of course, he felt honor-bound to warn her. I'll be ready. She sounded unconcerned. Then she looked up at him, straight in the eye, momentarily startling him with her direct gaze. I suppose they know that you invited me here for the purpose of asking me to be your wife. I never said anything to them. No, she murmured, you wouldn't. He looked over at her sharply, unable to discern if she meant that as an insult. I don't feel the need to keep my children apprised of my personal matters. She shrugged, a delicate little motion that he found infuriating. Miss Bridgerton, he said, I don't need your advice on how to raise my children. I didn't say a word on the subject, she returned, although I might point out that you do appear rather desperate to find them a mother, which would seem to indicate that you do want help. Until you agree to take on that role, he bit off, you may keep your opinions to yourself. She speared him with a frosty stare, then turned her attention back to her soup. After only two spoonfuls, however, she looked back up at him defiantly, and said, they need discipline. Do you think I don't know that? They also need love. They get love, he muttered. And attention. They get that, too. From you. Philip might have been aware that he was far from being a perfect father, but he was damned if he would allow someone else to say so. And I suppose you have deduced their state of shameful neglect during the twelve hours since your arrival. She snorted her disdain. It hardly required twelve hours to listen to them this morning, begging you to spend a paltry few minutes in their company. They did nothing of the sort, he retorted, but he could feel the tips of his ears growing hot, as they always did when he was lying. He didn't spend enough time with them, and he was mortified that she'd managed to figure that out in such a short amount of time. They practically begged you not to be busy all day, she shot back. If you spent a bit more time with them. You don't know anything about my children, he hissed. And you don't know anything about me. She stood abruptly. Clearly, she said, heading for the door. Wait, he called, jumping to his feet. Damn. How had this happened? Barely an hour ago, he'd been convinced that she would become his wife, and now she was practically on her way back to London. He let out a frustrated breath. Nothing had the ability to turn his temper like his children, or the discussion thereof. 
or, to be more precise, the discussion of his failings as their father. I'm sorry, he said, meaning it, too. Or at least meaning it enough not to want her to leave. Please. He held out his hand. Don't go. I'll not be treated like an imbecile. If there is one thing I've learned in the twelve hours since your arrival, he said, purposefully repeating his earlier words, it's that you're no imbecile. She regarded him for a few more seconds, then placed her hand in his. At the very least, he said, not even caring that he sounded as if he were pleading with her, you must stay until Amanda arrives. Her brows rose in question. Surely you'll want to savor your victory, he murmured, then added under his breath, I know I would. She allowed him to reseat her, but they had only one more minute together before Amanda came shrieking into the room, her nursemaid hot on her heels. Father! Amanda wailed, throwing herself onto his lap. Philip embraced her awkwardly. It was some time since he'd done so, and he'd forgotten how it felt. Whatever can be the problem, he asked, giving her a pat on the back for good measure. Amanda pulled her face out of its burrowed position in his neck and pointed one furious, shaking finger at Eloise. It's her, she said, as if referring to the devil himself, Miss Bridgerton? Philip asked. She put a fish in my bed. And you dumped flour on her head, he said sternly, so I'd say you're even. Amanda's little mouth fell open. But you're my father. Indeed. You're supposed to take my side. When you're in the right, it was a fish, she sobbed. So I smell. You'll want a bath, I imagine. I don't want a bath, she wailed. I want you to punish her. Philip smiled at that. She's rather big for punishing, wouldn't you agree? Amanda stared at him with horrified disbelief, and then finally, her lower lip shaking, she gasped, you need to tell her to leave. Right now, Philip set Amanda down, rather pleased with how the entire encounter was progressing. Maybe it was Miss Bridgerton's calm presence, but he seemed to have more patience than usual. He felt no urge to snap at Amanda, or to avoid the issue altogether by banishing her to her room. I beg your pardon, Amanda, he said, but Miss Bridgerton is my guest, not yours, and she will remain here as long as I wish. Eloise cleared her throat. Loudly. Or, Philip amended, as long as she wishes to remain. Amanda's entire face scrunched in thought, which doesn't mean, he said quickly, that you may torture her in an attempt to force her away. But. No buts. But. What did I just say? But she's mean. I think she's very clever, Philip said, and I wish I'd put a fish in your bed months ago. Amanda stepped back in horror. Go to your room, Amanda. But it smells bad. You have only yourself to blame. But my bed. You'll have to sleep on the floor, he replied. Face quivering entire body quivering, truth be told she dragged herself toward the door. But, but. Yes, Amanda, he asked, in what he thought to be an impressively patient voice. But she didn't punish Oliver, the little girl whispered. That wasn't very fair of her. The flower was his idea. Philip raised his brows. Well, it wasn't only my idea, Amanda insisted. We thought it up together. Philip actually chuckled. I wouldn't worry about Oliver if I were you, Amanda. Or rather, he said, giving his chin a thoughtful stroke with his fingers, I would worry. I suspect Miss Bridgerton has plans for him yet. That seemed to satisfy Amanda and she mumbled a barely articulate good night, father, before allowing her nursemaid to lead her from the room. Philip turned back to his soup, feeling very pleased with himself. He couldn't remember the last time he'd emerged from a run-in with one of the twins in which he'd felt he'd handled everything just right. He took a sip, then, still holding his spoon, looked over at Eloise and said, poor Oliver will be quaking in his boots. She appeared to be trying hard not to grin. He won't be able to sleep. Philip shook his head. Not a wink, I should think. And you should watch your step. I'd wager he'll set some sort of trap at his door. Oh, I have no plans to torture Oliver this evening, she said with a blithe wave of her hand. That would be far too easy to predict. 
I prefer the element of surprise. Yes, he said with a chuckle. I can see that you would. Eloise answered him with a smug expression. I would almost consider leaving him in perpetual agony, except that it really wouldn't be fair to Amanda. Philip shuddered. I hate fish. I know. You wrote me as much. I did? She nodded. Odd that Mrs. Smith even had any in the house, but I suppose the servants like it. They descended into silence, but it was a comfortable, companionable sort of quietude. And as they ate, moving through the courses of the supper as they chatted about nothing in particular, it occurred to Philip that perhaps marriage wasn't supposed to be so hard. With Marina, he'd always felt like he was tiptoeing around the house, always fearful that she was going to descend into one of her bouts with melancholia, always disappointed when she seemed to withdraw from life, and indeed, almost disappear. But maybe marriage was supposed to be easier than that. Maybe it was supposed to be like this. Companionable. Comfortable. He couldn't remember the last time he had spoken with anyone about his children, or the raising thereof. His burdens had always been his alone, even when Marina had been alive. Marina herself had been a burden, and he was still wrestling with the guilt he felt at his relief that she was gone. But Eloise. He looked across the table at the woman who had so unexpectedly fallen into his life. Her hair glowed almost red in the flickering candlelight, and her eyes, when she caught him staring at her, sparkled with vitality and just a hint of mischief. She was, he was coming to realize, exactly what he needed. Smart, opinionated, bossy, they weren't the sort of things men usually looked for in a wife, but Philip so desperately needs someone to come to Romney Hall and fix things. Nothing was quite right, from the house to his children, to the slightly hushed pall that had hung over the place when Marina had been alive, and sadly had not lifted even after her death. Philip would gladly cede some of his husbandly power to a wife if she would only make everything right again. He'd be more than happy to disappear into his greenhouse and let her be in charge of everything else. Would Eloise Bridgerton be willing to take on such a role? Dear God, he hoped so. Chapter 5 Implore you, mother, you must punish Daphne. It is not fair that I am the only one sent to bed without pudding. And for a week a week is far too long, especially since it was all mostly Daphne's idea. From Eloise Bridgerton to her mother, left upon Violet Bridgerton's night table. During Eloise's tenth year. It was strange, Eloise thought, how much could change in a single day. Because now, as Sir Philip was escorting her through his home, ostensibly viewing the portrait gallery but really just prolonging their time together, she was thinking. He might make a perfectly fine husband after all, not the most poetic way to phrase a concept that ought to have been full of romance and passion, but theirs wasn't a typical courtship, and with only two years remaining until her thirtieth birthday, Eloise couldn't really afford to be fanciful. But still, there was something. In the candlelight, Sir Philip was somehow more handsome, perhaps even a little dangerous-looking. The rugged planes of his face seemed to angle and shadow in the flickering light, lending him a more sculptured look, almost like the statues she'd visited at the British Museum, and as he stood next to her, his large hand possessively at her elbow, his entire presence seemed to envelop her. It was odd, and thrilling, and just a little bit terrifying. But gratifying, too. She'd done a crazy thing, running off in the middle of the night, hoping to find happiness with a man she'd never met. It was a relief to think that maybe it hadn't all been a complete mistake, that maybe she'd gambled with her future and won. Nothing would have been worse than slinking back to London, admitting failure and having to explain to her entire family what she'd done. She didn't want to have to admit that she'd been wrong, to herself or anyone else. But mostly to herself. Sir Philip had proven to be an enjoyable supper companion, even if he wasn't quite so glib or conversational as she was used to. But he obviously possessed a sense of fair play, which Eloise deemed essential in any spouse. He had accepted even admired her fish-in-the-bed technique with Amanda. Many of the men Eloise had met in London would have been horrified that a gently bred lady would even think of resorting to such underhanded tactics. And maybe, just maybe, this would work. Marriage to Sir Philip did seem a harebrained scheme when she allowed herself to think about it in a logical manner, 
but it wasn't as if he were a complete stranger, they had been corresponding for over a year, after all. My grandfather, Philip said mildly, gesturing to a large portrait. He was quite handsome, Eloise said, even though she could barely see him in the dim light. She motioned to the picture to the right. Is that your father? Philip nodded once, curtly, the corners of his lips, tightening. And where are you? she asked, sensing that he didn't wish to talk about his father. Over here, I'm afraid. Eloise followed his direction to a portrait of Philip as a young boy of perhaps twelve years, posing with someone who could only have been his brother. His older brother. What happened to him? she asked, since he had to be dead. If he lived, Philip could not have inherited his house or baronetcy. Waterloo, he answered succinctly. Impulsively, she placed her hand over his. I'm sorry. For a moment she didn't think he was going to say anything, but eventually, he let out a quiet, no one was sorrier than I. What was his name? George. You must have been quite young, she said, counting back to 1815 and doing the math in her head. 21. My father died two weeks following. She thought about that. At 21, she was supposed to have been married. All young ladies of her station were expected to have been married by then. One would think that would confer a measure of adulthood, but now 21 seemed impossibly young and green, and far too innocent to have inherited a burden one had never thought to receive. Marina was his fiancée, he said. Her breath rushed over her lips, and she turned to him, her hand falling away from his. I didn't know, she said. He shrugged. It doesn't matter. Here, would you like to see her portrait? Yes, Eloise replied, discovering that she did indeed wish to see Marina. They had been cousins, but distant ones, and it had been years since they'd visited with one another. Eloise remembered dark hair and light eyes blue, maybe, but that was all. She and Marina had been of an age, and so they had been thrust together at family gatherings, but Eloise didn't recall their ever having very much in common. Even when they were barely older than Amanda and Oliver, their differences had been clear. Eloise had been a boisterous child, climbing trees and sliding down banisters, always following her older siblings, begging them to allow her to take part in whatever they were doing. Marina had been quieter, almost contemplative. Eloise remembered tugging on her hand, trying to get her to come outside and play, but Marina had just wanted to sit with a book. Eloise had taken note of the pages, however, and she was quite convinced that Marina never moved beyond page 32. It was a strange thing to remember, she supposed, except that her nine-year-old self had found it so astounding why would someone choose to stay inside with a book when the sun was shining, and then not even read it? She'd spent the rest of the visit whispering with her sister Francesca, trying to figure out just what it was that Marina was doing with that book. Do you remember her? Philip asked. Just a little, Eloise replied, not sure why she didn't YSH to share her memory with him. And anyway, it was the truth. That was the sum of her recollections of Marina, that one week in April over twenty years earlier, whispering with Francesca as Marina stared at a book. Eloise allowed Philip to lead her over to Marina's portrait. She had been painted seated, on some sort of ottoman, with her dark red skirts artfully arranged about her. A younger version of Amanda was on her lap, and Oliver stood at her side, in one of those poses young boys were always forced to assume serious and stern, as if they were miniature adults. She was lovely, Eloise said. Philip just stared at the image of his dead wife, then, almost as if it required a force of will, turned his head and walked away. Had he loved her? Did he love her still? Marina should have been his brother's bride. Everything seemed to suggest that Philip had been given her by default. But that didn't mean he didn't love her. Maybe he had been secretly in love with her while she had been engaged to his brother. Or maybe he had fallen in love after the wedding. Eloise stole a look at his profile as he stared sightlessly at a painting on the wall. There had been emotion on his face when he had looked at Marina's portrait. She wasn't sure what he had felt for her, but it was definitely still something. It had only been a year, she reminded herself. A year might make up the official period of mourning, but it wasn't very long to get past the death of a loved one. Then he turned. 
His eyes hit hers, and she realized she'd been staring at him, mesmerized by the planes of his face. Her lips parted with surprise, and she wanted to look away, felt as if she ought to blush and stammer at having been caught, but somehow she could not. She just stood there, transfixed, breathless, as a strange heat spread across her skin. He was ten feet away, at the very least, and it felt as if they were touching. Eloise, he whispered, or at least she thought he did. She saw his lips form the word more than she actually heard his voice. And then somehow the moment was broken. Maybe it was his whisper, maybe the creak of a windblown tree outside, but Eloise was finally able to move to think and she quickly turned back to Marina's portrait, firmly affixing her gaze on her late cousin's serene face. The children must miss her, Eloise said, needing to say something, anything that would restart the conversation and restore her composure. For a moment, Philip said nothing. And then, finally, yes, they've missed her for a long time. It seemed to Eloise a rather odd way to phrase it. I know how they feel, she said. I was quite young when my father died. He looked over at her. I didn't realize. She shrugged, it's not something I talk about a great deal. It was a long time ago. He crossed back to her side, his steps slow and methodical. Did it take you very long to get over it? I'm not certain it's something you ever do get over, she said. Completely, that is. But no, I don't think about him every day, if that's what you want to know. She turned away from Marina's portrait, she'd been focusing on it for too long and was beginning to feel oddly intrusive. I think it was more difficult for my older brothers, she said. Anthony, he is the eldest and was already a young man when it happened, had a particularly difficult time with it. They were very close. And my mother, of course. She looked over at him. My parents loved each other very much. How did she react to his passing? Well, she cried a great deal at first, Eloise said. I'm sure we weren't meant to know. She always did it in her room at night, after she thought we were all asleep. But she missed him dreadfully, and it couldn't have been easy with seven children. I thought there were eight of you. Hyacinth was not yet born. I believe my mother was eight months along. Good God, she thought she heard him murmur. Good God was right. Eloise had no idea how her mother had managed. It was unexpected, she told him. He was stung by a bee. A bee. Can you imagine that? He was stung by a bee, and then, well, I don't need to bore you with the details. Here, she said briskly, let us leave. It's too dark in here to see the portraits properly, anyway. It was a lie, of course. It was too dark, but Eloise couldn't have cared less about that. Talking about her father's death always made her feel a bit strange, and she just didn't feel like standing there surrounded by paintings of dead people. I should like to see your greenhouse, she said. Now? Put that way, it did seem an odd request. Tomorrow, then, she said, when it's light. His lips curved into a hint of a smile. We can go now. But we won't be able to see anything. We won't be able to see everything, he corrected. But the moon is out, and we'll take a lantern. She glanced doubtfully out the window. It's cold, you can take a coat. He leaned down with a gleam in his eye. You're not afraid, are you? Of course not, she retorted, knowing he was baiting her, but falling for it, anyway. He quirked a brow in a most provoking manner, I'll have you know I'm the least cowardly woman you're ever likely to encounter. I'm sure you are, he murmured. Now you're being patronizing. He did nothing but chuckle. Very well, she said gamely, lead the way. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, it's so warm. Eloise exclaimed as Philip shut the greenhouse door behind her. It's actually usually warmer than this, he told her. The glass allows the sun to warm the air, but except for this morning, it's been quite overcast for the past few days. Philip often visited his greenhouse at night, toiling by the light of a lantern when he could not sleep. Or, before he'd been widowed, to keep him busy so that he would not consider entering Marina's bedchamber. But he had never asked anyone to accompany him in the dark, even during the day, he almost always worked alone. 
Now he was seeing it all through Eloise's eyes, the magic and the way the pearlescent moonlight threw shadows across the leaves and fronds. During the day, a walk through the greenhouse wasn't so very different from a walk through any wooded area in England, with the exception of the odd rare fern or imported bromeliad. But now, with the cloak of night playing tricks on the eyes, it was as if they were in some secret, hidden jungle, with magic and surprise lurking around every corner. What is this? Eloise asked, peering down at eight small clay pots, arranged in a line across his workbench. Philip walked to her side, absurdly pleased that she seemed truly curious. Most people just feigned interest, or didn't even bother to pretend, and made a quick escape. It's an experiment I've been working on, he said, with peas. The kind we eat? Yes. I'm trying to develop a strain that will grow fatter in the pod. She peered down at the pots. Nothing was sprouting yet, he'd only planted the seeds a week ago. How curious, she murmured, I had no idea one could do that. I have no idea if one can, he admitted. I've been trying for a year. With no success? How very frustrating. I've had some success, he admitted, just not as much as I'd like. I tried to grow roses one year, she told him, they all died. Roses are more difficult than most people think, he said. Her lips twisted slightly. I noticed you have them in abundance. I have a gardener. A botanist with a gardener? He'd heard that question before, many times. It's no different than a dressmaker with a seamstress. She considered that for a moment, then moved farther into the greenhouse, stopping to peer at various plants, and scold him for not keeping up with her with the lantern. You're a bit bossy this evening, he said. She turned, caught that he was smiling half-smiling, at least, and offered him a wicked grin. I prefer to be called managing. A managing sort of female, eh? I'm surprised you didn't deduce as much from my letters. Why do you think I invited you, he countered. You want someone to manage your life, she asked, tossing the words over her shoulder as she moved flirtatiously away from him. He wanted someone to manage his children, but now didn't seem like the best time to bring them up. Not when she was looking at him as if, as if she wanted to be kissed. Philip had taken two slow, predatory steps in her direction before he even realized what he was doing. What is this? she asked, pointing to something. A plant. I know it's a plant, she said with a laugh. If I'd, but then she looked up, caught the gleam in his eyes, and quieted. May I kiss you? he asked. He would have stopped if she'd said no, he supposed, but he didn't allow her much opportunity, closing the distance between them before she could reply. May I? he repeated, so close that his words were whispered across her lips. She nodded, the motion tiny, but sure, and brushed his mouth against hers, gently, softly, as one was supposed to kiss a woman one thought one might marry. But then her hand stole around and touched his neck, and God help him, but he wanted more. Much more. He deepened the kiss, ignoring her gasp of surprise as he parted her lips with his tongue. But even that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted to feel her, her warmth, her vitality, up and down the length of him, around him, through him, infusing him. He slid his hands around her, settling one against her upper back even as another daringly found the lush curve of her bottom. He pressed her against him, hard, not caring that she would feel the evidence of his desire. It had been so long. So damned long, and she was so soft and sweet in his arms. He wanted her. He wanted all of her, but even his passion-haste mind knew that that was impossible this evening, and so he was determined to have the next best thing, which was just the feel of her, the sensation of her in his arms the heat of her running along the entire length of his body. And she was responding. Hesitantly, at first, as if she wasn't quite sure what she was doing, but then, with greater ardor, making innocently seductive little sounds from the back of her throat. It drove him wild, she drove him wild. Eloise, Eloise, he murmured, his voice hoarse and raspy with need. He sank one hand into her hair tugging at it until her coiffure loosened and one thick chestnut lock slid out to form a seductive curlicue on her breastbone. His lips moved to her neck, tasting her skin, 
exulting when she arched back and offered him greater access. And then, just when he'd started to sink down, his knees bending as his lips trailed over her collarbone, she wrenched herself away. I'm sorry, she blurted out, her hands flying up to the neckline of her dress even though it wasn't the least bit out of place. I'm not, he said baldly. Her eyes widened at his bluntness. He didn't care. He'd never been particularly fancy with words, and it was probably best that she learned that now, before they did anything permanent. And then she surprised him. It was a figure of speech, she said. I beg your pardon? I said I was sorry. I wasn't, really. It was a figure of speech. She sounded remarkably composed and almost schoolteacherish, for a woman who had just been so soundly kissed. People say things like that all the time, she continued, just to fill the silence. Philip was coming to realize that she wasn't the sort of woman who liked silence. It's rather like when one. He kissed her again. Sir Philip, sometimes, he said with a satisfied smile, silence is a good thing. Her mouth fell open. Are you saying I talk too much? He shrugged, having too much fun teasing her to do anything else. I'll have you know that I have been much quieter here than I am at home, that's difficult to imagine. Sir Philip. Shoo, he said, reaching out and taking her hand, then taking it again, more firmly this time, when she snatched it away. We need a bit of noise around here. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, Eloise woke the following morning as if she were still wrapped in a dream. She hadn't expected him to kiss her. And she hadn't expected to like it quite so much. Her stomach let out an angry growl, and she decided to make her way down to the breakfast room. She had no idea if Sir Philip would be there. Was he an early riser? Or did he like to remain Abed until noon? It seemed silly that she didn't know these things about him when she was seriously contemplating marriage. And if he was there, waiting for her over a plate of coddled eggs, what would she say to him? What did one say to a man after he'd had his tongue in one's ear? Never mind that it had been a very nice tongue, indeed. It was still quite beyond scandalous. What if she got there and could barely manage, good morning? He'd surely find that amusing, after teasing her about her loquaciousness the night before. It almost made her laugh. She, who could carry on a conversation about nothing in particular and frequently did, wasn't sure what she was going to say when she next saw Sir Philip Crane. Of course, he had kissed her, that changed everything. Crossing the room, she checked to make sure that her door was firmly shut before she opened it. She didn't think that Oliver and Amanda would try the same trick twice, but one never knew. She didn't particularly relish the thought of another flower bath. Or worse, after the fish incident, they were probably thinking more along the lines of something liquid. Something liquid and smelly. Humming softly to herself, she stepped out into the hall and turned to the right to make her way to the staircase. The day seemed filled with promise. The sun had actually been peeking out through the clouds this morning when she'd looked out the window, and... Oh! The shriek ripped itself right out of her throat as she plunged forward, her foot caught behind something that had been strung out across the hall. She didn't even have a chance to try to regain her balance. She had been walking quickly as was her habit, and when she fell, she fell hard. And without even the time to use her hands to break her fall. Tears burned her eyes. Her chin dear God, her chin felt like it was on fire, the sight of it, at least. She had just managed to twist her head ever so slightly to the side before she fell. She moaned something incoherent, the sort of noise one makes when one hurts so badly that one simply cannot keep it all inside and she kept waiting for the pain to subside, thinking that this would be like a stubbed toe, which throbs mercilessly for a few seconds, and then, once the surprise of it is over, slides into nothing more than a dull ache. But the pain kept burning. On her chin, on the side of her head, on her knee, and on her hip. She felt beaten. Slowly, with great effort, she forced herself up onto her hands and knees, and then into a sitting position. She allowed herself to lean against the wall and lifted her hand to cradle her cheek, taking quick bursts of breath through her nose to try to control the pain. Eloise. Philip.
She didn't bother to look up, didn't want to move from her curled up position. Eloise, my God, he said, triple stepping the last few stairs as he rushed to her side. What happened? I fell. She hadn't meant to whimper, but it came out that way, anyway, with a tenderness that seemed out of place on a man of his size, he took her hand in his and pulled it from her cheek. The next words he said were not ones that were often uttered in Eloise's presence. You need a piece of meat on that, he said. She looked up at him with watery eyes, am I bruised? He nodded grimly. You may have a blackened eye. It's still too soon to tell. She tried to smile, tried to put a game face on it, but she just couldn't manage it. Does it hurt very badly? he asked softly. She nodded, wondering why the sound of his voice made her want to cry even more. It reminded her of when she was small and she'd fallen from a tree. She'd sprained her ankle, quite badly, but somehow she'd managed not to cry until she'd made it back home. One look from her mother and she'd begun to sob. Philip touched her cheek gingerly his features pulling into a scowl when she winced. I'll be fine, she assured him. And she would. In a few days. What happened? And of course she knew exactly what had happened. Something had been strung across the hall, put in place to make her trip and fall. It didn't require very much intelligence to guess who had done it. But Eloise didn't want to get the twins in trouble. At least not the sort of trouble they were likely to find themselves in once Sir Philip got hold of them. She didn't think they'd intended to cause quite so much harm. But Philip had already spied the thin length of twine, tightly drawn across the hall and tied around the legs of two tables, both of which had been tugged toward the center of the hall when Eloise had tripped. Eloise watched as he knelt down, touching the string and twisting it around his fingers. He looked over at her, not with question in his eyes, but rather a grim statement of fact. I didn't see it, she said, even though that was quite obvious. Philip didn't take his eyes off of hers, but his fingers kept twisting the string until it tautened and snapped. Eloise sucked in her breath. There was something almost terrifying in the moment. Philip didn't seem aware that he'd broken the string, barely cognizant of his strength. Or the strength of his anger. Sir Philip, she whispered, but he never heard her. Oliver, he bellowed. Amanda. I'm sure they didn't mean to injure me, Eloise began, not certain why she was defending them. They'd hurt her, that was true, but she had a feeling her punishment would be considerably less painful than anything coming from their father. I don't care what they meant, Philip snapped. Look how close you landed to the stairs. What if you'd fallen? Eloise eyed the stairs. They were close, but not close enough for her to have taken a tumble. I don't think. They must answer for this, he said, his voice deadly low and shaking with rage. I'll be fine, Eloise said. Already the stinging pain was giving way to a duller ache. But it still hurt, enough so that when Sir Philip lifted her into his arms, she let out a little cry. And his fury grew. I'm putting you in bed, he said, his voice rough and curt. Eloise offered no disagreement. A maid appeared on the landing, gasping when she saw the darkening bruise on Eloise's face. Get me something for this, Sir Philip ordered. A piece of meat. Anything. The maid nodded and ran off as Philip carried Eloise into her room. Are you hurt anywhere else? he asked. My hip, Eloise admitted as he settled her on top of her covers. And my elbow, he nodded grimly. Do you think you've broken anything? No, she said quickly. No, I. I'll need to check, anyway, he said, brushing aside her protests as he lightly examined her arm. Sir Philip, I. My children just nearly killed you, he said, without a trace of humor in his eyes. I should think you could dispense with the sir, Eloise swallowed as she watched him cross the room to the door, his strides long and powerful. Get me the twins immediately, he said, presumably to some servant hovering outside in the hall. Eloise couldn't imagine that the children hadn't heard his earlier bellow, but she also couldn't blame them for attempting to delay judgment day at the hands of their father. Philip, she said, trying to coax him back into the room with the sound of her voice, leave them to me. 
I was the injured party, and they are my children, he said, his voice harsh, and I will punish them. God knows it's long past due. Eloise stared at him with growing horror. He was nearly shaking with rage, and while she could have happily swatted the children on their bottoms herself, she didn't think he ought to be meeting out punishment in his state. They hurt you, Philip said in a low voice. That is not acceptable. I'll be fine, she assured him again. In a few days I won't even. That is not the point, he said sharply. If I had. He stopped, tried again with, if I hadn't. He stopped, beyond words, and leaned against the wall, his head hanging back as his eyes searched the ceiling for what, she didn't know. Answers, she supposed. As if one could find answers with the simple upward sweep of the eyes. He turned, looked at her, his eyes grim, and Eloise saw something on his face she hadn't expected to see there. And that was when she realized it all that rage in his voice, in the shaking of his body it wasn't directed at the children. Not really, and certainly not entirely. The look on his face, the bleakness in his eyes, it was self-loathing. He didn't blame his children. He blamed himself. Chapter 6 Should not have let him kiss you. Who knows what liberties he will attempt to take the next time you meet. But what's done is done, I suppose, so all there is left is to ask, was it lovely? From Eloise Bridgerton to her sister Francesca, slid under the door of her bedroom. The night Francesca met the Earl of Kilmartin, whom she would marry two months later. When the children entered the room, half dragged and half pushed by their nursemaid, Philip forced himself to remain rigidly in his position against the wall, afraid that if he went to them he'd beat them both within an inch of their lives and even more afraid that when he was through, he wouldn't regret his actions. So instead, he just crossed his arms and stared, letting them squirm under the heat of his fury, while he tried to figure out what the hell he meant to say. Finally, Oliver spoke up, his voice trembling as he said, Father? Philip said the only thing that came to mind, the only thing that seemed to matter. Do you see Miss Bridgerton? The twins nodded, but they didn't quite look at her at least not at her face, which was beginning to purple around the eye. Do you notice anything amiss about her? They said nothing, forcing a silence until a maid appeared in the doorway with a sir. Philip acknowledged her arrival with a nod, then strode to take hold of the piece of meat she'd brought for Eloise's eye. Hungry, he snapped at his children. When they didn't reply, he said, good. Because sadly, none of us will be eating this, will we? He crossed the room to the bed, then sat down gently at Eloise's side. Here, he said, still too angry for his voice to be anything but gruff. Brushing aside her efforts to help, he set the meat against her eye, then arranged a piece of cloth over it so that she would not have to dirty her fingers while keeping it in place. Then, when he was done, he walked over to where the twins were cowering, and stood in front of them, arms crossed. And waited. Look at me, he ordered, when neither removed their gaze from the floor. When they did, he saw terror in their eyes, and it sickened him, but he didn't know how else he was supposed to act. We didn't mean to hurt her, Amanda whispered. Oh, you didn't, he bit off, turning on them both with palpable fury. His voice was icy, but his face clearly showed his anger, and even Eloise shrank back in her bed. You didn't think she might possibly be hurt when she tripped over the string? Philip continued, his sarcasm lending him a controlled air that was even more frightening. Or perhaps you realized correctly that the string itself wasn't likely to cause injury, but it didn't occur to you that she might be hurt when she actually fell. They said nothing. He looked at Eloise, who had lifted the meat from her face and was gingerly touching her cheekbone. The bruise under her eye seemed to be worsening by the minute. The twins had to learn that they couldn't continue like this. They needed to learn that they had to treat people with more respect. They needed to learn. Philip swore under his breath. They needed to learn something. He jerked his head toward the door. You will come with me. He walked into the hall, turned back at them, and snapped, now. And as he led them from the room, he prayed that he could control himself. Eloise tried not to listen, but she couldn't seem to stop herself from straining her ears. 
She didn't know where Philip was taking the children, it could be the next room, it could be the nursery, it could be outside. But one thing was certain. They were going to be punished, and while she thought they should be punished what they had done was inexcusable and they were certainly old enough to have realized that she still found herself oddly worried for them. They had looked terrified when Philip had led them away, and there was that niggling memory from the day before, when Oliver had blurted out the question, are you going to hit us? He had recoiled when he'd said it, as if he were expecting to be hit. Surely Sir Philip didn't. No, that was impossible, Eloise thought. It was one thing to give children a spanking at a time like this, but surely he didn't strike his children habitually. She couldn't have made such a misjudgment about a person. She had let the man kiss her the night before, kissed him in return, even. Surely she would have felt that something was wrong, sensed an inner cruelty if Philip were the sort who beat his children. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Oliver and Amanda filed in, looking somber and red-eyed, followed by a grim-faced Sir Philip, whose job at the rear was clearly to keep the children walking at a pace that exceeded that of a snail. The children shuffled over to her bedside, and Eloise turned her head so that she could see them. She couldn't see out of her left eye with the meat covering it, and of course that was the side the children had chosen. We're sorry, Miss Bridgerton, they mumbled. Louder, came their father's sharply worded directive. We're sorry. Eloise gave them a nod. It won't happen again, Amanda added. That's certainly a relief to hear, Eloise said. Philip cleared his throat. Father says we must make it up to you, Oliver said. Air. Eloise wasn't exactly certain how they meant to do that. Do you like sweets? Amanda blurted out. Eloise looked at her blinking her good eye in confusion. Sweets? Amanda's chin shook up and down. Well, yes, I suppose I do. Doesn't everyone? I have a box of lemon drops. I've saved them for months. You can have them. Eloise swallowed against the lump in her throat as she watched Amanda's tortured expression. There was something wrong with these children. Or if not with them, then for them. Something wasn't right in their lives. With all of her nieces and nephews, Eloise had seen enough happy children to know this. That will be all right, Amanda, she said, her heart wrenching. You may keep your lemon drops. But we have to give you something, Amanda said, casting a fearful glance at her father. Eloise was about to tell her that that wasn't necessary, but then, as she watched Amanda's face, she realized that it was. In part, of course, because Sir Philip had obviously insisted upon it, and Eloise wasn't about to undermine his authority by saying otherwise, but also because the twins needed to understand the concept of making amends. Very well, Eloise said. You may give me an afternoon. An afternoon? Yes. Once I'm feeling better, you and your brother may give me an afternoon. There is much here at Romney Hall with which I'm unfamiliar and I imagine you two know every last corner of the house and grounds. You may take me on a tour. Provided, of course, she added, because she did value her health and well-being, that you promise there will be no pranks. None, Amanda said quickly, her chin bobbing in an earnest nod. I promise. Oliver, Philip growled, when his son did not speak quickly enough. There will be no pranks that afternoon, Oliver muttered. Philip strode across the room and grabbed his son by the collar. Ever. Oliver said in a strangled voice. I promise. We shall leave Miss Bridgerton completely alone. Not completely, I hope, Eloise said, glancing up at Philip and hoping he correctly interpreted that to mean, you may now put down the child. After all, you do owe me an afternoon. Amanda offered her a tentative smile, but Oliver's scowl remained firmly in place. You may leave now, Philip said, and the children fled through the open doorway. The two adults remained in silence for a full minute after they left, both staring at the door with hollow, weary expressions. Eloise felt drained and weary, almost as if she'd been dropped into a situation she didn't quite understand. A burst of nervous laughter almost escaped her lips. What was she thinking? Of course she had been dropped into a situation she didn't understand and she was lying to herself if she thought she knew what to do. 
Philip walked over to the bed, but when he got there, he stood rather stiffly. How are you? he asked Eloise. If I don't remove this meat soon, she said quite frankly, I think I might be sick. He picked up the platter the meat had arrived upon and held it out. Eloise put the steak down, grimacing at the wet, slopping sound it made. I believe I would like to wash my face, she said. The smell is rather overwhelming. He nodded. First let me look at your eye. Do you have very much experience with this sort of thing? She asked, glancing at the ceiling when he asked her to look up. A bit. He pressed gently against the ridge of her cheekbone with his thumb. Look right. She did. A bit? I boxed at university. Were you good? He turned her head to the side. Look left. Good enough. What does that mean? Close your eye. What does that mean? She persisted. You're not closing your eye. She did, shutting them both, because whenever she winked only one eye she ended up squeezing it far too tightly. What does it mean? She couldn't see him, but she could feel him pause. Has anyone ever told you you can be a bit stubborn? All the time. It's my only flaw. She heard his smile and the tenor of his breath. The only one, eh? The only one worth commenting upon. She opened her eyes. You didn't answer my question. I've quite forgotten what it was. She opened her mouth to repeat it, then realized he was teasing her, so she scowled instead. Close your eye again, he said. I'm not yet finished. When she obeyed his command, he added, good enough meant I never had to fight if I didn't want to. But you weren't the champion, she surmised. You can open your eye now. She did, then blinked when she realized how close he still was. He stepped back. I wasn't the champion. Why not? He shrugged. I didn't care about it enough. How does it look? She asked. Your eye? She nodded, I don't think there is anything to be done to stop the bruising. I didn't think I hit my eye, she said, letting out a frustrated sigh. When I fell, I thought I hit my cheek. You don't have to hit your eye to bruise there. I can see from your face that you landed right here, he touched her. Cheekbone, right where she'd hit, but he was so gentle that she felt no pain and that's close enough for the bleeding to spread to the eye area. She groaned. I'm going to look a fright for weeks. It might not take weeks. I have brothers, she said, giving him a look that said she knew what she was talking about. I've seen blackened eyes. Benedict had one that didn't completely fade away for two months. What happened to him? Philip asked. My other brother, she said wryly. Say no more, he said. I had a brother of my own. Beastly creatures, she muttered, the lot of them. But there was love in her voice as she said it. Yours probably won't take that long, he said, helping her to stand so that she could make her way to the wash basin. But it might. Philip nodded, then, once she was splashing the smell of the meat off her skin, said, we need to get you a chaperone. She froze. I'd quite forgotten. He let several seconds go by before replying, I hadn't. She picked up a towel and patted herself dry. I'm sorry. It's my fault, of course. You had written that you would arrange for a chaperone. In my haste to leave London, I quite forgot that you would need time to make the arrangements. Philip watched her closely, wondering if she realized that she had slipped and said more than she'd probably meant to. It was difficult to imagine a woman such as Eloise open, bright, and extremely talkative as having secrets but she had been quite close-lipped about her reasons for coming to Gloucestershire. She'd said that she was looking for a husband, but he suspected that her reasons had as much to do with what she'd left behind in London as they did with what she hoped to find here in the country, and then she'd said in my haste. Why had she left in a hurry? What had happened there? I have already contacted my great-aunt, he said, helping her back into her bed even though she quite clearly wanted to do it herself. I sent her a letter the morning you arrived, but I doubt she could be here any earlier than Thursday. She only lives in Dorset, but she's not the sort to leave her home at the drop of a hat. She will want time to pack, I'm sure, 
and do all those things, he waved his hand about in a slightly dismissive manner that women need to do. Eloise nodded, her expression serious. It's only four days. And you've a great many servants. It's not as if we're alone together at some remote hunting box. Nonetheless, your reputation could be seriously compromised should people learn of your visit. She let out a long exhale, then lifted her shoulders in a fatalistic gesture. Well, there isn't much I can do about it now. She motioned to her eye. If I returned, my current appearance would cause more comment than the fact that I left in the first place. He nodded slowly, signaling his agreement even as his mind flew off in other directions. Was there a reason she was so unconcerned for her reputation? He'd not spent much time in society, but it was his experience that unmarried ladies, regardless of their age, were always concerned for their reputations. Was it possible that Eloise's reputation had been ruined before she'd arrived on his doorstep? And more to the point, did he care? He frowned, unable to answer the latter question just yet. He knew what he wanted now, make that what he needed in a wife, and it had little to do with purity and chastity and all those other ideals that proper young ladies were meant to embody. He needed someone who could step in and make his life easy and uncomplicated. Someone who would run his house and mother his children. He was quite frankly pleased to have found in Eloise a woman for whom he felt a great deal of desire as well, but even if she'd been ugly as a crone well, he'd have been happy to marry a crone as long as she was practical, efficient, and good with his children. But if all that were true, why did he feel rather annoyed by the possibility that Eloise had had a lover? No, not annoyed, precisely. He couldn't quite put his finger on the correct word for his feelings. Irritated, he supposed, the way one was irritated by a pebble in one's shoe or a mild sunburn. It was that feeling that something wasn't quite right. Not dreadfully, catastrophically wrong, but just not, right. He watched her settle herself against the pillows. Do you want me to leave you to your rest? he asked. She sighed. I suppose, although I'm not tired. Bruised, perhaps, but not tired. It's barely eight in the morning. He glanced at a clock on a shelf. Nine. Eight, nine, she said, shrugging off the difference. Whichever, it's still morning. She looked longingly out the window. And it's finally not raining. Would you prefer to sit in the garden? he inquired. I'd prefer to walk in the garden, she replied pertly, but my hip does ache a bit. I suppose I should try to rest for a day. More than a day, he said gruffly. You're most probably right, but I can assure you I won't be able to manage it. He smiled. She wasn't the sort of woman who would ever choose to spend her days sitting quietly in a drawing room, working on her embroidery or sewing, or whatever it was women were supposed to do with needles and thread. He looked over at her as she fidgeted. She wasn't the sort of woman who would ever choose to sit still, period. Would you like to take a book with you? he asked. Her eyes clouded with disappointment. He knew that she'd expected him to accompany her to the garden, and heaven knew, part of him wanted to, but somehow he felt he had to get away, almost as a measure of self-preservation. He still felt off balance, desperately ill at ease, from having had to spank the children. It seemed that every fortnight they did something that required punishment, and he didn't know what else to do. But he drew no pleasure from the act. He hated it, absolutely hated it, felt almost as if he might wretch every time, and yet what was he supposed to do when they misbehaved that badly? The little things he tried to brush aside, but when they glued their governess's hair to her bedsheets while she slept, how was he supposed to brush aside that? Or what about the time they had broken an entire shelf of terracotta pots in his greenhouse? They had claimed it was an accident, but Philip knew better, and the look in their eyes as they protested their innocence told Hint that even they hadn't thought he'd actually believe them. And so he disciplined them in the only way he knew how, although thus far he'd been able to avoid using anything other than his hand. When, that is, he did anything at all. Half the time more than half, really he was so overcome by memories of his own father's brand of discipline that he just stumbled away, shaking and sweating, horrified by the way his hand itched to sweat them on their behinds. He worried that he was too lenient. He probably was, since the children didn't seem to be getting any better. 
He told himself he needed to be more stern, and once he'd even strode out to the stables and grabbed the whip. He shuddered at the memory. It was after the glue incident, and they'd had to cut away Miss Lockhart's hair just to free her, and he'd been so angry, so unbelievably, overpoweringly angry. His vision had gone red, and all he'd wanted to do was punish them, and make them behave, and teach them how to be good people, and he'd snatched the whip, but it had burned in his hands and he dropped it in horror, afraid of what he would become if he actually used it. The children had gone unpunished for an entire day. Philip had fled to his greenhouse, shaking with disgust, hating himself for what he'd almost done, and for what he was unable to do. Make his children better people, he didn't know how to be a father to them. That much was clear. He didn't know how, and maybe he simply wasn't suited to the task. Maybe some men were born knowing what to say and how to act, and some of them simply couldn't do a good job of it no matter how hard they tried. Maybe one needed a good father oneself to know how to be the same, which had left him doomed from birth. And now here he was, trying to make up for his deficiencies with Eloise Bridgerton. Perhaps he could finally stop feeling so guilty about being such a bad father if he could only provide them with a good mother. But nothing was ever as simple as one wanted it to be and Eloise, in the single day she'd been in residence, had managed to turn his life upside down. He'd never expected to want her, at least not with the intensity he felt every time he stole a glance at her. And when he'd seen her on the floor, why was it that his first thought had been terror? Terror for her well-being, and, if he was honest, terror that the twins might have convinced her to leave. When poor Miss Lockhart had been glued to the bed, Philip's first emotion had been rage at his children. With Eloise, he'd spared only the merest of thoughts for them until he'd assured himself that she was not seriously injured. He hadn't wanted to care about her, hadn't wanted anything other than a good mother for his children. And now he didn't know what to do about it. And so even though a morning in the garden with Miss Bridgerton sounded like heaven, somehow he couldn't quite allow himself the pleasure. He needed some time alone. He needed to think. Or rather, to not think, since the thinking just left him angry and confused. He needed to bury his hands in some dirt and prune some plants, and shut himself away until his mind was no longer screaming with all of his problems. He needed to escape. And if he was a coward, so be it. Chapter 7 Have never been so bored in all of my life. Colin, you must come home. It is interminably boring without you and I don't think I can bear such boredom another moment. Please do return, for I have clearly begun to repeat myself, and nothing could be more of a bore. From Eloise Bridgerton to her brother Colin, during her fifth season as a debutante, sent, but never received, while Colin was traveling in Denmark. Eloise spent the entire day in the garden, lounging on an exceedingly comfortable chaise that she was quite convinced had been imported from Italy since it was her experience that neither the English nor the French had any clue as to how to fashion comfortable furniture, not that she normally spent a great deal of time pondering the construction of chairs and sofas, but stuck outside by herself in the Romney Hall garden, it wasn't as if she had anything else to ponder. No, not a thing, not a single thing to think about other than the comfortable chaise beneath her and maybe the fact that Sir Philip was an ill-mannered beast for leaving her alone for the entire day after his two little monsters whose existence she added into her thoughts with a mental flourish he had never seen fit to reveal in his correspondence had given her a blackened eye. It was a perfect day, with a blue sky and a light breeze, and Eloise didn't have a single thing in the world to think about. She had never been so bored in her life. It wasn't in her nature to sit still and watch the clouds float by. She would much rather be out doing something, taking a walk, inspecting a hedgerow, anything other than just sitting like a lump on the chaise, staring aimlessly at the horizon. Or if she had to sit here, at least she could have done so in the company of another person. She supposed the clouds might have been more interesting if she weren't quite so alone, if someone were here to whom she might say, goodness, but that one looks rather like a rabbit, don't you think? But no, she'd been left quite on her own. Sir Philip was off in his greenhouse, she could see it from here, even see him moving about from time to time and while she really wanted to get up and join him, if for no other reason than the fact that his plants had to be more interesting than the blasted clouds, 
she wasn't about to give him the satisfaction of seeking him out. Not after he'd rejected her so abruptly this afternoon. Good heavens, the man had practically fled from her company, it had been the oddest thing. She'd thought they were dealing with each other rather well, and then he'd grown, quite abrupt, making up some sort of excuse about how he needed to work and fleeing the room as if she were plagued. Odious man, she picked up the book she'd selected from the library and held it resolutely in front of her face. She was going to read the blasted thing this time if it killed her. Of course, that was what she'd told herself the last four times she'd picked it up. She never managed to get past a single sentence a paragraph if she was really disciplined before her mind wandered and the text on the page grew unfocused and, it went without saying, unread. Served her right, she supposed, for being so irritated with Sir Philip that she hadn't paid any attention in the library and she'd snatched up the first book she'd seen. The Botany of Ferns? What had she been thinking? Even worse, if he saw her with it. He'd surely think she'd chosen it because she wanted to learn more about his interests. Eloise blinked with surprise when she realized that she had reached the end of her page. She didn't recall a single sentence, and in fact wondered if perhaps her eyes had only slid along the words without actually reading the letters. This was ridiculous. She thrust the book aside and stood up, taking a few steps to test out the tenderness of her hip allowing herself a satisfied smile when she realized that the pain wasn't bad at all, and in fact, couldn't even be called anything beyond mild discomfort, she walked all the way to the riotous mass of rosebushes off to the north, leaning forward to sniff the buds. They were still tightly closed, it was early in the season, after all, but maybe they'd have a scent, and... What the devil are you doing? Eloise just managed to avoid falling into the rosebush as she turned around. Sir Philip, she said, as if that weren't completely obvious, he looked irate. You're supposed to be sitting down. I was sitting down. You were supposed to stay sitting down. She decided the truth would make an excellent explanation. I was bored. He glanced over at the chaise in the distance. Didn't you get a book from the library? She shrugged. I finished it. He quirked a brow in patent disbelief. She returned his expression with an arch look of her own. Well, you need to sit down, he said gruffly. I'm perfectly fine. She patted her hip gently. It hardly hurts at all now. He stared at her for some time, his expression irritable, as if he wanted to say something but didn't know what. He must have left the greenhouse in a hurry, because he was quite filthy, with dirt along his arms, under every fingernail, and streaked quite liberally on his shirt. He looked a fright, at least by the standards Eloise had grown used to in London, but there was something almost appealing about him, something rather primitive and elemental as he stood there scowling at her. I can't work if I have to worry about you, he grumbled. Then don't work, she replied, thinking the solution quite obvious. I'm in the middle of something, he muttered, sounding, in Eloise's opinion, at least, rather like a sullen child. Then I'll accompany you, she said brushing past him on the way to the greenhouse. Really, how did he expect them to decide if they would suit if they didn't spend any time together? He reached out to grab her, then remembered that his hand was covered with dirt. Miss Bridgerton, he said sharply, you can't, couldn't you use the help, she interrupted. No, he said, and in such a tone that she really couldn't continue the argument along those lines. Sir Philip, she ground out, completely losing patience with him, may I ask you a question? Visibly startled by her sudden turn of conversation, he just nodded once, curtly, the way men liked to do when they were annoyed and wanted to pretend they were in charge. Are you the same man you were last night? He looked at her as if she were a lunatic. I beg your pardon, the man I spent the evening with last night, she said, just barely resisting the urge to cross her arms as she spoke the one with whom I shared a meal and then toward the house and greenhouse, actually spoke to me, and in fact, seemed to enjoy my company, astonishing as it might seem. He did nothing but stare at her for several seconds, then muttered, I enjoy your company. Then why, she asked, have I been sitting alone in the garden for three hours? It hasn't been three hours. It doesn't matter how long. It's been forty-five minutes, he said, be that as it may. Be that as it is. 
well, she declared, mostly because she suspected he might have been correct, which put her in something of an awkward position, and well, seemed all she could say without embarrassing herself further. Miss Bridgerton, he said, his clipped voice a reminder that just the night before he'd been calling her Eloise. And kissing her. As you might have guessed, he continued sharply, this morning's episode with my children has left me in a foul mood. I thought merely to spare you my company, such as it is, I see, she said, rather impressed with the supercilious edge to her voice. Good. Except that she was quite certain she did see. That he was lying, to be precise. Oh, his children had put him in a foul mood, that much was true, but there was something else at work as well. I will leave you to your work, then, she said, motioning to the greenhouse with a gesture that was meant to seem as if she were waving him away. He eyed her suspiciously. And what do you plan to do? I suppose I shall write some letters and then go for a walk, she replied. You will not go for a walk, he growled. Almost Eloise thought, as if he actually cared about her. Sir Philip, she replied, I assure you that I am perfectly fine. I'm quite certain I look a great deal worse than I feel. You had better look worse than you feel, he muttered. Eloise scowled at him. It was a blackened eye, after all, and thus only a temporary blight on her appearance, but truly, he didn't need to remind her that she looked a fright. I shall remain out of your way, she told him, which is all that really matters, correct? A vein began to twitch in his temple. Eloise took great pleasure in that. Go, she said. And when he didn't, she turned and began to walk through a gate to another segment of the garden. Stop this instant, Sir Philip ordered, closing the distance between them with a single step. You may not go for a walk. Eloise wanted to ask him if he intended to tie her down, but she held her tongue, fearing that he might actually approve of the suggestion. Sir Philip, she said, I fail to see how, oh. Grumbling something about fully sh women, and using another adjective, which Eloise considered considerably less complimentary, Sir Philip scooped her into his arms and strode over to the chaise, where he dumped her quite unceremoniously back onto the cushion. Stay there, he ordered. She sputtered, trying to find her voice after his unbelievable display of arrogance. You can't. Good God, woman, you could try the patience of a saint. She glared at him. What, he asked, with weary impatience, would it take to keep you from moving from this spot? I can't think of a thing, she answered, quite honestly. Fine, he said, his chin jutting out in a furiously stubborn manner, hike the entire countryside. Swim to France. From Gloucestershire, she asked, her lips twitching. If anyone could figure out a way to do it, he said, it would be you. Good day, Miss Bridgerton. And then he stalked off, leaving Eloise exactly where she'd been ten minutes earlier. Sitting on the chaise, so surprised by his sudden departure that she quite forgot that she'd meant to get up and leave. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. If Philip hadn't already been convinced that he had made an ass of himself earlier that day, Eloise's short missive informing him that she intended to take supper in her room that evening made it quite clear. Considering she'd spent the afternoon complaining that she had no company, her decision to pass the evening by herself was a pointed insult, indeed. He ate alone, in silence, as he had for so many months. Years, really, since Marina had rarely left her room to dine when she'd been alive. One would have thought he'd have grown used to it, but now he was restless and uncomfortable, ever aware of the servants, who all knew that Miss Bridgerton had rejected his company. He grumbled to himself as he chewed his beefsteak. He knew that one was supposed to ignore the servants and go about daily life as if they didn't exist, or if they did, as if they were an entirely different species altogether. And while he had to admit he didn't have much interest in their lives outside of Romney Hall, the fact remained that they had interest in his, and he rather detested being the subject of gossip. Which he surely would be tonight, as they gathered for supper in the alcove off the kitchen, he took a vicious bite of his roll. He hoped they had to eat that damned fish from Amanda's bed. He made his way through the salad and the poultry and the pudding, even though the soup and the meat had proven quite enough 
but there was always the chance that Eloise would change her mind and join him for supper. It didn't seem likely, given her stubborn streak, but if she decided to bend her will, he wanted to be present when it happened. When it became apparent that this was nothing but wishful thinking on his part, he considered going up to her, but even out here in the country, that was quite inappropriate, and besides, he doubted she wanted to see him. Well, that wasn't quite true. He rather thought that she did want to see him, but she wanted him humbled and apologetic. And even if he didn't utter a single word resembling either I'm or sorry, his very appearance would be tantamount to eating crow. Which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, considering that he'd already decided he'd be willing to wrap himself around her feet and beg her piteously to marry him if she would only consent to stay and mother his children. This, even though he had botched it up completely this afternoon and morning, really, if one were to be honest about it. But wanting to woo a woman didn't mean one actually knew how to go about it. His brother had been the one born with all the charm and flair, always knowing what to say and how to act. George would never have even noticed that the servants were eyeing him as if they were going to gossip about him ten minutes later, and in truth, the point was moot, because all that the servants had ever had to say was along the lines of, that Master George is such, a rascal. All said with a smile and a blush, of course. Philip, on the other hand, had been quieter, more thoughtful, and certainly less suited to the role of father and lord of the manor. He'd always planned to leave Romney Hall and never look back, at least while his father was still alive. George was to marry Marina and have a half-dozen perfect children, and Philip would be the gruff and slightly eccentric uncle who lived over in Cambridge, spending all his time in his greenhouse, conducting experiments that no one else understood or in truth even cared about. That was how it was supposed to be, but it had all changed on a battlefield in Belgium. England had won the war, but that had been little comfort to Philip when his father had dragged him back to Gloucestershire determined to mold him into a proper heir. Determined to change him into George, who had always been his favorite. And then his father had died. Right there, right in front of Philip, his heart gave out in a screaming rage, surely exaggerated by the fact that his son was now too large to be hauled over his knee and beaten with a paddle. And Philip became Sir Philip, with all the rights and responsibilities of a baronet. Rights and responsibilities he had never, ever wanted. He loved his children, loved them more than life itself, so he supposed he was glad for the way it had all turned out, but he still felt as if he were failing. Romney Hall was doing well Philip had introduced several new agricultural techniques he'd learned at university, and the fields were turning a profit for the first time since, well, Philip didn't know since when. They certainly hadn't earned any money while his father had been alive. But the fields were only fields. His children were human beings, flesh and blood, and every day he grew more convinced that he was failing them. Every day seemed to bring worse trouble, which terrified him. He couldn't imagine what could possibly be worse than Miss Lockhart's glued hair or Eloise's blackened eye, and he had no idea what to do. Whenever he tried to talk to them, he seemed to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, or not do anything, all because he was so scared that he'd lose his temper. Except for that one time. Supper last night with Eloise and Amanda. For the first time in recent memory, he'd handled his daughter exactly right. Something about Eloise's presence had calmed him, lent him a clarity of thought he usually lacked when it came to his children. He was able to see the humor in the situation where he usually saw nothing but his own frustration, which was all the more reason he needed to make sure Eloise stayed and married him. And all the more reason he wasn't going to go to her tonight and try to make amends. He didn't mind eating crow. Hell, he would have eaten an entire flock if that was what it took. He just didn't want to muck up the situation any worse than it already was. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Eloise rose quite early the following morning which wasn't surprising, since she'd crawled into bed at only half eight the night before. She'd regretted her self-imposed exile almost the moment after she'd sent the note down to Sir Philip informing him of her decision to take supper in her room. She'd been thoroughly annoyed with him earlier in the day, and she'd allowed her irritation to rule her thinking. The truth was, 
She hated eating by herself, hated sitting alone at a table with nothing to do but stare at her food and guess how many bites it might take to finish one's potatoes. Even Sir Philip in his most obstinate and uncommunicative of moods would have been better than nothing. Besides, she still wasn't convinced that they wouldn't suit, and dining apart wasn't going to offer her any further insight into his personality and temperament. He could be a bear and a grumpy one, at that, but when he smiled, Eloise suddenly understood what all those young ladies were talking about when they'd waxed rhapsodic over her brother Colin's smile, which Eloise found rather ordinary, it was Colin, after all. But when Sir Philip smiled, he was transformed. His dark eyes assumed a devilish twinkle, full of humor and mischief, as if he knew something she didn't. But that wasn't what sent her heart fluttering. Eloise was a Bridgerton, after all. She'd seen plenty of devilish twinkles and prided herself on being quite immune to them. When Sir Philip looked at her and smiled, there was an air of shyness to it, as if he weren't quite used to smiling at women. And she was left with the feeling that he was a man who, if all the pieces of their puzzle fell together in just the right way, might someday come to treasure her. Even if he never loved her, he would value her and not take her for granted. And it was for that reason that Eloise was not yet prepared to pack her bags and leave, despite his rather gruff behavior of the previous day. Stomach growling, she made her way down to the breakfast room, only to be informed that Sir Philip had already come and gone. Eloise tried not to be discouraged. It didn't mean he was trying to avoid her. It was entirely possible, after all, that he had assumed she was not an early riser and had elected not to wait for her. But when she peeked into his greenhouse and found it empty, she declared herself stymied and went looking for other company. Oliver and Amanda owed her an afternoon, didn't they? Eloise marched resolutely up the stairs. There was no reason they couldn't make it a morning, instead. You want to go swimming? Oliver was looking at her as if she were mad. I do, Eloise replied with a nod. Don't you? No, he said. I do, Amanda piped up, sticking her tongue out at her brother when he shot her a ferocious glare. I love to swim, and so. Does Oliver, he's just too cross with you to admit it. I don't think they should go, replied their nursemaid, a rather stern-looking woman of indeterminate years. Nonsense, Eloise said breezily, disliking the woman immediately. She looked the sort to tug on ears and wrap hands. It is unseasonably warm and a bit of exercise will be quite helpful. Nevertheless, the nursemaid said, her testy voice demonstrating her irritation at having her authority challenged. I shall give them lessons while we go about it, Eloise continued, using the tone of voice her mother used when it was clear. She would brook no argument. They are currently without a governess, aren't they? Indeed, the nurse said, the two little monsters glued. Whatever the reason for her departure, Eloise interrupted, quite certain she didn't want to know what they had done to their last governess, I'm sure it has been a monstrous burden upon you to assume both roles these last few weeks. Months, the nursemaid bit off. Even worse, Eloise agreed. One would think you deserve a free morning, wouldn't one? Well, I wouldn't mind a brief trip into town. Then it's settled. Eloise glanced down at the children and allowed herself a small moment of self-congratulation. They were staring at her in awe. Off you go, she said to the nurse, bustling her out the door. Enjoy your morning. She shut the door behind the still bewildered nurse and turned to face the children. You are very clever, Amanda said breathlessly. Even Oliver couldn't help but nod his agreement. I hate Nurse Edwards, Amanda said. Of course you don't, Eloise said, but her heart wasn't into the statement, she hadn't much liked Nurse Edwards either. Yes, we do, Oliver said. She's horrid. Amanda nodded. I wish we could have Nurse Mills by back, but she had to leave to care for her mother. She's sick, she explained. Her mother, Oliver said, not Nurse Mills by. How long has Nurse Edwards been here? Eloise asked. Five months, Amanda said glumly. Five very long months. Well, I'm sure she's not as bad as all that, Eloise said, intending to say more, 
but closing her mouth when Oliver interrupted with, Oh, she is. Eloise wasn't about to disparage another adult, especially one who was meant to have some authority over them, so instead, she decided to sidestep the issue by saying, It doesn't matter this morning, does it, because you have me instead. Amanda reached out shyly and took her hand. I like you, she said. I like you, too, Eloise replied, surprised by the tears forming in the corners of her eyes. Oliver said nothing. Eloise wasn't insulted, it took some people longer to warm up to a person than others. Besides, these children had a right to be wary. Their mother had left them, after all. Granted, it was through death, but they were young, all they would know was that they had loved her and she was gone. Eloise remembered well the months following the death of her father. She had clung to her mother at every opportunity, telling herself that if she just kept her nearby, or even better, holding her hand, then her mother couldn't leave, either. Was it any wonder that these children resented their new nursemaid? They had probably been cared for by Nurse Millsby since birth. Losing her so soon after Marina's death must have been doubly difficult. I'm sorry we blackened your eye, Amanda said. Eloise squeezed her hand. It looks much worse than it actually is. It looks dreadful, Oliver admitted, his little face beginning to show signs of remorse. Yes, it does, Eloise agreed, but it's starting to grow on me. I think I look rather like a soldier who's been to battle and won. You don't look like you've won, Oliver said, one corner of his mouth twisting in a dubious expression. Nonsense. Of course I do. Anyone who actually comes home from battle wins. Does that mean Uncle George lost? Amanda asked. You father's brother? Amanda nodded. He died before we were born. Eloise wondered if they knew that their mother was originally to have married him. Probably not. Your uncle was a hero. She said with quiet respect. But not father, Oliver said. Your father couldn't go to war because he had too many responsibilities here, Eloise explained. But this is a very serious conversation for such a fine morning, don't you think? We should be out swimming and having a grand time. The twins quickly caught her enthusiasm, and in no time they were changed into their bathing costumes and headed across the fields to the lake. We must practice our arithmetic. Eloise called out as they skipped ahead. And much to her surprise, they actually did. Who would have known that sixes and eights could be so much fun? Chapter 8 How fortunate you are to be at school. We girls have been presented with a new governess and she is misery personified. She drones on about sums from dawn until dusk. Poor Hyacinth now breaks into tears every time she hears the word seven, although I must confess that I don't understand why one through six do not elicit similar reactions. I don't know what we shall do. Dip her hair in ink, I suppose. Miss Haversham's, that is, not Hyacinth's, although I would never rule out the latter. From Eloise Bridgerton to her brother Gregory, during his first TERM as a student at Eton. When Philip returned from the Rose Garden, he was surprised to find his home quiet and empty. It was a rare day when the air wasn't exploding with the sound of some overturned table or shriek of outrage. The children, he thought, pausing to savor. The silence. Clearly, they had been vacated from the premises. Nurse Edwards must have taken them out for a walk. And, he supposed, Eloise would still be Abed, although in truth it was already nearly ten, and she did not seem the sort to laze. The day away under her covers. Philip stared down at the roses in his hand. He'd spent an hour choosing exactly the right ones, Romney Hall boasted three. Rose gardens, and he'd had to go to the far one to find the early blooming varieties. He then painstakingly picked them careful to snip at the exact right spot so as to encourage further blooming, and then meticulously sliced away each thorn. Flowers he could do. Green plants he could do even better, but somehow he didn't think Eloise would find much romance in. A fistful of ivy. He wandered over to the breakfast room, expecting to see food laid out, awaiting Eloise's arrival, but the sideboard was tidy. And spotless, signaling that the morning meal had come to an end. Philip frowned and stood in the middle of the room for a moment, 
trying to figure out what he ought to do next. Eloise had obviously already arisen and eaten breakfast, but deuced if. He knew where she was. Just then a maid came through, holding a feather duster and a rag, she bobbed a quick curtsy when she saw him. I'll need a vase for these, he said, holding up the flowers. He'd hoped to hand them to Eloise directly, but he didn't feel like clutching them all morning while he hunted her down. The maid nodded and started to leave, but he stopped her with, Oh, and do you happen to know where Miss Bridgerton might have gone off to? I noticed that breakfast has been cleared. Out, Sir Philip, the maid said. With the children. Philip blinked in surprise. She went out with Oliver and Amanda? Willingly? The maid nodded, that's interesting. He sighed, trying not to envision the scene. I hope they don't kill her. The maid looked alarmed. Sir Philip? It was a joke, ah. Uh. Mary? He didn't mean to finish his sentence on a questioning note, but the truth was, he wasn't quite certain of her name. She nodded in such a way that he couldn't be sure whether he'd gotten it right or she was just being polite. Do you happen to know where they went? he asked. Down to the lake, I believe. To go swimming. Philip's skin went cold. Swimming? he asked, his voice sounding disembodied and hollow to his ears. Yes. The children were wearing their bathing costumes. Swimming. Dear God. For a year now, he'd avoided the lake, always taken the long route around, just to spare himself the sight of it, and he had forbidden the children from ever visiting the site. Or had he? He'd told Nurse Millsby not to allow them near the water, but had he remembered to do the same with Nurse Edwards? He took off at a run, leaving the floor littered with roses. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, last one in is a hermit crab. Oliver shrieked, tearing into the water at top speed, only to laugh when it reached his waist and he was forced to slow down. I'm not a hermit crab. You're a hermit crab. Amanda yelled back as she splashed around in the shallower depths. You're a rotten hermit crab. Well, you're a dead hermit crab. Eloise laughed as she waded through the water a few yards away from Amanda. She hadn't brought a bathing costume, and it was for that reason that Eloise was not yet prepared to pack her bags and leave, despite his rather gruff behavior of the previous day. Stomach growling, she made her way down to the breakfast room, only to be informed that Sir Philip had already come and gone. Eloise tried not to be discouraged. It didn't mean he was trying to avoid her, it was entirely possible, after all that he had assumed she was not an early riser and had elected not to wait for her. But when she peeked into his greenhouse and found it empty, she declared herself stymied and went looking for other company. Oliver and Amanda owed her an afternoon, didn't they? Eloise marched resolutely up the stairs. There was no reason they couldn't make it a morning, instead. You want to go swimming? Oliver was looking at her as if she were mad. I do, Eloise replied with a nod. Don't you? No, he said. I do, Amanda piped up, sticking her tongue out at her brother when he shot her a ferocious glare. I love to swim, and so. Does Oliver, he's just too cross with you to admit it. I don't think they should go, replied their nursemaid, a rather stern-looking woman of indeterminate years. Nonsense, Eloise said breezily, disliking the woman immediately. She looked the sort to tug on ears and wrap hands. It is unseasonably warm and a bit of exercise will be quite healthful. Nevertheless, the nursemaid said, her testy voice demonstrating her irritation at having her authority challenged. I shall give them lessons while we go about it, Eloise continued, using the tone of voice her mother used when it was clear. She would brook no argument. They are currently without a governess, aren't they? Indeed, the nurse said, the two little monsters glued. Whatever the reason for her departure, Eloise interrupted, quite certain she didn't want to know what they had done to their last governess, I'm sure it has been a monstrous burden upon you to assume both roles these last few weeks. Months, the nursemaid bit off. Even worse, Eloise agreed. One would think you deserve a free morning, wouldn't one? Well, I wouldn't mind a brief trip into town. Then it's settled. 
Eloise glanced down at the children and allowed herself a small moment of self-congratulation. They were staring at her in awe. Off you go, she said to the nurse, bustling her out the door. Enjoy your morning. She shut the door behind the still bewildered nurse and turned to face the children. You are very clever, Amanda said breathlessly. Even Oliver couldn't help but nod his agreement. I hate Nurse Edwards, Amanda said. Of course you don't, Eloise said, but her heart wasn't into the statement, she hadn't much liked Nurse Edwards either. Yes, we do, Oliver said. She's horrid. Amanda nodded. I wish we could have Nurse Mills by back, but she had to leave to care for her mother. She's sick, she explained. Her mother, Oliver said, not Nurse Mills by. How long has Nurse Edwards been here? Eloise asked. Five months, Amanda said glumly. Five very long months. Well, I'm sure she's not as bad as all that, Eloise said, intending to say more, but closing her mouth when Oliver interrupted with. Oh, she is. Eloise wasn't about to disparage another adult especially one who was meant to have some authority over them, so instead. She decided to sidestep the issue by saying, it doesn't matter this morning, does it, because you have me instead. Amanda reached out shyly and took her hand. I like you, she said. I like you, too, Eloise replied, surprised by the tears forming in the corners of her eyes. Oliver said nothing. Eloise wasn't insulted. It took some people longer to warm up to a person than others. Besides, these children had a right to be wary. Their mother had left them, after all. Granted, it was through death, but they were young, all they would know was that they had loved her and she was gone. Eloise remembered well the months following the death of her father. She had clung to her mother at every opportunity, telling herself that if she just kept her nearby, or even better, holding her hand, then her mother couldn't leave, either. Was it any wonder that these children resented their new nursemaid? They had probably been cared for by Nurse Millsby since birth. Losing her so soon after Marina's death must have been doubly difficult. I'm sorry we blackened your eye, Amanda said. Eloise squeezed her hand. It looks much worse than it actually is. It looks dreadful, Oliver admitted, his little face beginning to show signs of remorse. Yes, it does, Eloise agreed, but it's starting to grow on me. I think I look rather like a soldier who's been to battle and won. You don't look like you've won, Oliver said, one corner of his mouth twisting in a dubious expression. Nonsense. Of course I do. Anyone who actually comes home from battle wins. Does that mean Uncle George lost? Amanda asked. You father's brother? Amanda nodded. He died before we were born. Eloise wondered if they knew that their mother was originally to have married him. Probably not. Your uncle was a hero. She said with quiet respect. But not father, Oliver said. Your father couldn't go to war because he had too many responsibilities here, Eloise explained. But this is a very serious conversation for such a fine morning, don't you think? We should be out swimming and having a grand time. The twins quickly caught her enthusiasm, and in no time they were changed into their bathing costumes and headed across the fields to the lake. We must practice our arithmetic. Eloise called out as they skipped ahead. And much to her surprise, they actually did. Who would have known that sixes and eights could be so much fun? Chapter 8 How fortunate you are to be at school. We girls have been presented with a new governess and she is misery personified. She drones on about sums from dawn until dusk. Poor Hyacinth now breaks into tears every time she hears the word seven, although I must confess that I don't understand why one through six do not elicit similar reactions. I don't know what we shall do. Dip her hair in ink, I suppose. Miss Haversham's, that is, not Hyacinth's, although I would never rule out the latter. From Eloise Bridgerton to her brother Gregory, during his first TERM as a student at Eton. When Philip returned from the Rose Garden, he was surprised to find his home quiet and empty. It was a rare day when the air wasn't exploding with the sound of some overturned table or shriek of outrage. The children, he thought, pausing to savor. The silence. 
Clearly, they had been vacated from the premises. Nurse Edwards must have taken them out for a walk. And, he supposed, Eloise would still be Abed, although in truth it was already nearly ten, and she did not seem the sort to laze. The day away under her covers. Philip stared down at the roses in his hand. He'd spent an hour choosing exactly the right ones, Romney Hall boasted three. Rose Gardens, and he'd had to go to the far one to find the early blooming varieties. He then painstakingly picked them, careful to snip at the exact right spot so as to encourage further blooming, and then meticulously sliced away each thorn. Flowers he could do. Green plants he could do even better, but somehow he didn't think Eloise would find much romance in. A fistful of ivy. He wandered over to the breakfast room, expecting to see food laid out, awaiting Eloise's arrival, but the sideboard was tidy and spotless, signaling that the morning meal had come to an end. Philip frowned and stood in the middle of the room for a moment, trying to figure out what he ought to do next. Eloise had obviously already arisen and eaten breakfast, but deuced if. He knew where she was. Just then a maid came through, holding a feather duster and a rag. She bobbed a quick curtsy when she saw him. I'll need a vase for these, he said, holding up the flowers. He'd hoped to hand them to Eloise directly, but he didn't feel like clutching them all morning while he hunted her down. The maid nodded and started to leave, but he stopped her with, Oh, and do you happen to know where Miss Bridgerton might have gone off to? I noticed that breakfast has been cleared. Out, Sir Philip, the maid said. With the children. Philip blinked in surprise. She went out with Oliver and Amanda? Willingly? The maid nodded, that's interesting. He sighed, trying not to envision the scene. I hope they don't kill her. The maid looked alarmed. Sir Philip? It was a joke, ah. Uh. Mary? He didn't mean to finish his sentence on a questioning note, but the truth was, he wasn't quite certain of her name. She nodded in such a way that he couldn't be sure whether he'd gotten it right or she was just being polite. Do you happen to know where they went, he asked. Down to the lake, I believe. To go swimming. Philip's skin went cold. Swimming, he asked, his voice sounding disembodied and hollow to his ears. Yes. The children were wearing their bathing costumes. Swimming. Dear God. For a year now, he'd avoided the lake, always taken the long route around, just to spare himself the sight of it and he had forbidden the children from ever visiting the site. Or had he? He'd told Nurse Millsby not to allow them near the water, but had he remembered to do the same with Nurse Edwards? He took off at a run, leaving the floor littered with roses. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, last one in is a hermit crab. Oliver shrieked, tearing into the water at top speed, only to laugh when it reached his waist and he was forced to slow down. I'm not a hermit crab. You're a hermit crab. Amanda yelled back as she splashed around in the shallower depths. You're a rotten hermit crab. Well, you're a dead hermit crab. Eloise laughed as she waded through the water a few yards away from Amanda. She hadn't brought a bathing costume. Indeed, who would have thought she might need one? So she had tied her skirt and petticoat up, bearing her legs to just above. Her knees. It was an awful lot of leg to be showing, but that hardly mattered in the company of two eight-year-olds. Besides, they were having far too much fun tormenting each other to give her legs even a passing glance. The twins had warmed up to her during their walk down to the lake, laughing and chattering the entire way, and Eloise wondered if all they truly needed was a bit of attention, they'd lost their mother, their relationship with their father was distant at best, and then their beloved nurse had left them. Thank heavens they had each other. And maybe, perhaps, her. Eloise bit her lip, not sure whether she ought even to be allowing her thoughts to veer in that direction. She hadn't yet decided whether she wanted to marry Sir Philip, and much as these two children seemed to need her, and they did need her, she just knew they did she couldn't make her decision, based on Oliver and Amanda. She wasn't going to be marrying them. Don't go any deeper, she called out, mindful that Oliver had been inching away. 
He pulled the sort of face boys do when they think they are being mollycoddled, but she noticed that he took too large. Steps back toward the shore. You should come in further, Miss Bridgerton, Amanda said, sitting down on the lake bottom and then squealing, oh. It's cold. Why did you sit down, then? Oliver said. You knew how cold it was. Yes, but my feet were used to it, she replied, hugging her arms to her body. It didn't feel so cold anymore. Don't worry, he told her with a supercilious grin, your bottom will get used to it soon, too. Oliver, Eloise said sternly, but she was fairly certain she'd ruined the effect, by smiling. He's right. Amanda exclaimed, turning to Eloise, with an expression of surprise. I can't feel my bottom at all anymore. I'm not so sure that's a good thing, Eloise said. You should swim, Oliver prodded, or at least go as far as Amanda. You barely got your feet wet. I don't have a bathing costume, Eloise said, even though she'd explained this to them at least six times already. I think you don't know how to swim, he said. I assure you I know very well how to swim, she returned, and that you're not likely to provoke a demonstration while I'm wearing my third best morning dress. Amanda looked over at her and blinked a few times. I should like to see your first and second best. That's a very pretty frock. Why, thank you, Amanda, Eloise said, wondering who picked out the young girl's clothing. The crotchety nurse Edwards, probably. There was nothing wrong with what Amanda was wearing, but Eloise would wager that no one had ever thought to offer her the fun of choosing her own garments. She smiled at Amanda and said, If you would like to go shopping sometime, I would be happy to take you. Oh, I should adore that, Amanda said breathlessly. Above all else. Thank you. Girls, Oliver said disdainfully. You'll be glad for us someday, Eloise remarked. Eh? She just shook her head with a smile. It would be some time before he thought girls were good for anything other than tying. Their plates together, Oliver just shrugged and went back to hitting the surface of the water with the heel of his hand at just the right angle so as to splash the maximum amount of water on his sister. Stop it. Amanda hollered. He cackled and splashed some more. Oliver. Amanda stood up and advanced menacingly toward him. Then, when walking proved too slow, she dove in and began to swim. He shrieked with laughter and swam away, coming up for air only long enough to taunt her. I'll get you yet. Amanda growled, stopping for a moment to tread water. Don't go too far out. Eloise called, but it really wasn't very important. It was clear that both children were excellent swimmers. If they were like Eloise and her siblings, they'd probably been swimming since age four. The Bridgerton children had spent countless summer hours splashing around in the pond near their home in Kent, although, in truth, the swimming had been curtailed after the death of their father. When Edmund Bridgerton had been alive, the family had spent most of their time in the country. But once he was gone, they had found themselves in town more often than not. Eloise had never known if it was because her mother preferred town or simply that their home in the country held too many memories. Eloise adored London and had certainly enjoyed her time there, but now that she was here in Gloucestershire, splashing in a pond with two boisterous young children, she realized how much she'd missed the country way of living. Not that she was prepared to give up London and all the friends and amusements it offered, but still, she was beginning to think she didn't need to spend quite so much time in the capital. Amanda finally caught up with her brother and launched herself on top of him, causing them both to go under. Eloise watched carefully. She could see a hand or foot break the surface every few seconds until they both came up for air, laughing and gasping and vowing to beat each other in what was clearly extremely important warfare. Be careful. Eloise called out, mostly because she felt she should. It was strange to find herself in the position of authoritative adult, with her nieces and nephews she got to be the fun and permissive aunt. Oliver. Do not pull your sister's hair. He stopped, but then immediately moved to the collar of her bathing costume, which could not have been comfortable for Amanda and indeed, she began to sputter and cough. Oliver! Eloise yelled. Stop that at once. 
He did, which surprised and pleased her, but Amanda used the momentary reprieve to jump on top of him, sending him under while she sat on his back. Amanda! Eloise yelled. Amanda pretended not to hear. Oh, blast, now she was going to have to wait out there to put an end to it herself, and she was going to be completely soaked in the process. Amanda, stop that this instant, she called out, making one last attempt to save her dress and her dignity. Amanda did, and Oliver came up gasping, Amanda Crane, I'm going to. No, you're not, Eloise said sternly. Neither one of you is going to kill, maim, attack or even hugged the other for at least thirty minutes. They were clearly appalled that Eloise had even mentioned the possibility of a hug. Well? Eloise demanded. They were completely silent, then Amanda asked, then what will we do? Good question. Most of Eloise's own memories of swimming involved the same sort of war games. Maybe we'll dry off. And rest for a spell, she said. They both looked horrified by the suggestion. We certainly ought to work on lessons, Eloise added. Perhaps a bit more arithmetic. I did promise Nurse Edwards that. We would do something constructive with our time. That suggestion went over about as well as the first. Very well, Eloise said. What do you suggest we do? I don't know, came Oliver's muttered reply, punctuated by Amanda's shoulder shrug. Well, there is certainly no point in standing here doing nothing, Eloise said planting her hands on her hips. Aside from the fact that it's exceedingly boring, we're likely to fr. Get out of the lake. Eloise whirled around, so surprised by the furious roar that she slipped and fell in the water. Drat and blast, there went her dry intentions and her dress. Sir Philip, she gasped, thankful that she'd broken her fall with her hands and had not landed on her bottom. Still, the front of her dress was completely soaked. Get out of the water, Philip growled, striding into the lake with astonishing force and speed. Sir Philip, Eloise said, her voice cracking with surprise as she staggered to her feet, what? But he had already grabbed both of his children, his arms wrapped around each of their rib cages, and was hauling them to. Sure. Eloise watched with fascinated horror as he set them none too gently down on the grass. I told you never, ever to go near the lake he yelled, shaking each by a shoulder. You know you're supposed to stay away. You. He stopped, clearly shaken by something, and by the need to catch his breath. But that was last year, Oliver whimpered. Did you hear me rescind the order? No, but I thought. You thought wrong, Philip snapped. Now get back to the house. Both of you. The two children recognized the deadly serious intent in their father's eyes and quickly fled up the hill. Philip did nothing as. They left, just watched them run, and then, as soon as they were out of earshot, he turned to Eloise with an expression that caused her to take a step back and said, What the hell did you think you were doing? For a moment she could say nothing, his question seemed too ludicrous for a reply. Having a spot of fun, she finally said, probably with a bit more insolence than she ought. I do not want my children near the lake, he bit off. I have made those wishes clear. Not to me. Well, you should have. How was I meant to know that you wanted them to stay away from the water, she asked, interrupting him before he could accuse her of irresponsibility or whatever it was he was going to say. I told their nurse where we intended to go and what we intended to do, and she gave no indication that it was forbidden. She could see from his face that he knew he had no valid argument, and it was making him all the more furious. Men. The day they learned to admit to a mistake was the day they became women. It's a hot day, she continued, her voice clipping along in the way it always did when she was determined not to lose an argument. Which, for Eloise, generally meant any argument. I was trying to mend the breach, she added, since I don't particularly relish the thought of another blackened eye. She said it to make it him feel guilty, and it must have worked, since his cheeks turned ruddy and he muttered something. That might have been an assurance under his breath. Eloise paused for a few seconds to see if he would say more, or, even better, say something with a tone that approached intelligible speech, but when he did nothing but glare at her, she continued with, I thought that doing something fun might. 
go a long way. Heaven knows, she muttered, the children could use a spot of fun. What are you saying, he asked, his voice angry and low. Nothing, she said quickly. Just that I didn't see any harm in going swimming. You put them in danger. Danger, she sputtered. From swimming? Philip said nothing, just glared at her. Oh, for heaven's sake, she said dismissively, it would only have been dangerous if I couldn't swim. I don't care if you can swim, he bit off. I only care that my children can't. She blinked. Several times. Yes, they can, she said. In fact, they're both quite proficient. I'd assumed you'd top them. What are you talking about? Her head tilted slightly, perhaps out of concern, perhaps out of curiosity. Didn't you know they could swim? For a moment, Philip felt as if he couldn't breathe. His lungs tightened and his skin prickled, and his body seemed to freeze. Into a hard, cold statue. It was awful. He was awful. Somehow this moment seemed to crystallize all of his failings. It wasn't that his children could swim, it was that he hadn't known they could swim. How could a father not know such a thing about his own children? A father ought to know if his children could ride a horse. He ought to know if they could read and count to one hundred. And for the love of God, he ought to know if they could swim. I he said, his voice giving out after a single word. I. She took a step forward, whispering, Are you all right? He nodded, or at least he thought he nodded. Her voice was ringing in his head, yes they can, yes, they can, they can, they can, and it didn't even matter what she was saying. It had been the tone. Surprise, and maybe even a hint of disdain. And he hadn't known, his children were growing and changing, and he didn't know them. He saw them, he recognized them, but he didn't know. Who they were. He felt himself take a gasp of air. He didn't know what their favorite colors were. Pink? Blue? Green? Did it matter, or did it only matter that he didn't know? He was, in his own way, every bit as awful a father as his own had been. Thomas Crane may have beaten his children too. Within an inch of their lives, but at least he knew what they were up to. Philip ignored and avoided and pretended anything, to keep his distance and avoid losing his temper. Anything to stop him from becoming his father all over again. Except maybe distance wasn't always such a good thing. Philip? Eloise whispered, laying a hand on his arm. Is something the matter? He stared at her, but he still felt blinded, and his eyes couldn't seem to focus. I think you should go home, she said, slowly and carefully. You don't look well. I'm he meant to say I'm fine, but the words didn't quite come out. Because he wasn't fine, and he wasn't good, and these days he wasn't even sure what he was. Eloise chewed on her lower lip, then hugged her arms to her chest and glanced up at the sky as a shadow passed over her. Philip followed her gaze, watched as a cloud slid over the sun, dropping the temperature of the air at least ten degrees. He looked at Eloise, his breath catching in his throat as she shivered. Philip felt colder than he ever had in his life. You need to get inside, he said, grabbing her arm and attempting to haul her. Up the hill. Philip, she yelped, stumbling along behind him. I'm fine, just a little chilled. He touched her skin. You're not just a little chilled, you're bloody well freezing. He yanked off his coat. Put this on. Eloise didn't argue, but she did say, truly, I'm fine. There is no need to run. The last word came out halfway strangled as he yanked her forward, nearly off her feet. Philip, stop, she yelped. Please, just let me walk. He halted so quickly that she stumbled, whirling around and hissing, I will not be responsible for your freezing yourself, into a lung fever. But it's May. I don't care if it's bloody July. You will not remain in those wet clothes. Of course not, Eloise replied, trying to sound reasonable, since it was quite clear that argument was simply going to make him dig his heels in even further, but there is no reason I cannot walk. It's only ten minutes back to the house. I'm not. 
going to die. She hadn't thought that blood could literally drain from a person's face, but she had no idea how else to describe the sudden blanching of his skin. Philip, she asked, growing alarmed. What is wrong? For a moment she didn't think he was going to answer, and then, almost as if he weren't aware that he was making a noise, he whispered, I don't know. She touched his arm and gazed up at his face. He looked confused, almost dazed, as if he'd been dropped into a theatrical play and didn't know his lines. His eyes were open, and they were on her, but she didn't think he saw anything, just a memory of something that must have been very awful, indeed. Her heart broke for him. She knew bad memories, knew how they could squeeze a heart and haunt one's dreams until one was afraid to blow out the candle. Eloise had, at the age of seven, watched her father die, shrieked and sobbed as he'd gasped for air and collapsed to the ground, then beaten against his chest when he could no longer speak, begging him to wake up and say something. It was obvious now that he'd already been dead by that point, but somehow that made the memory even worse. But Eloise had managed to put that behind her. She didn't know how it was probably all due to her mother, who had come to her side every night and held her hand and told her it was all right to talk about her father. And it was all right to miss him. Eloise still remembered, but it no longer haunted her, and she hadn't had a nightmare in over a decade. But Philip, his was a different story. Whatever had happened to him in the past, it was still very much with him. And unlike Eloise, he was facing it alone. Philip, she said, touching his cheek. He didn't move, and if she hadn't felt his breath on her fingers, she would have sworn. He was a statue. She said his name again, stepping even closer. She wanted to erase that shattered look from his eyes, she wanted to heal him. She wanted to make him the person she knew he was, deep down in his heart. She whispered his name one last time, offering him compassion and understanding and the promise of help, all in one single word. She hoped he heard, she hoped he listened. And then, slowly, his hand covered hers. His skin was warm and rough, and he pressed her hand against his cheek, as if he were trying to sear her touch into his memory. Then he moved her hand to his mouth and kissed her palm, intensely, almost reverently, before sliding it down to his chest. Across his beating heart. Philip, she whispered, question in her voice even though she knew what he intended to do. His free hand found the small of her back, and he pulled her to him, slowly but surely, with a firmness she could not deny. And then he touched her chin and tilted her face to his, stopping only to whisper her name, before capturing her mouth in a kiss that was blinding in its intensity. He was hungry, needy, and he kissed her as if he would die without her, as if she were his very food, his air, his body, and soul. It was the type of kiss a woman could never forget, the sword Eloise had never even dreamed possible. He pulled her even closer, until the entire length of her body was pressed up against his. One of his hands traveled down her, back to her bottom, cupping her, pulling her against him until she gasped at the intimacy of it. I need you, he groaned, the words sounding as if they were ripped from his throat. His lips slid off her mouth to her cheek, then down her neck teasing and tickling as they went. She was melting. He was melting her, until she didn't know who she was or what she was doing. All she wanted was him. More of him. All of him. Except. Except not like this, not when he was using her like some sort of sucker to heal his wounds. Philip, she said, somehow finding the strength to pull back. We can't. Not like this. For a moment she didn't think he would let her go, but then, abruptly, he did. I'm sorry, he said, breathing hard, he looked. Dazed, and she didn't know if that was from the kiss or simply from the tumultuous events of the morning. Don't apologize, she said, instinctively smoothing her skirts, only to find them wet and unsmoothable. But she ran her. Hands along them anyway, feeling nervous and uncomfortable in her own body. If she didn't move, didn't force herself into some sort of meaningless motion, she was afraid she would launch herself back into his arms. You should go back to the house, he said, his voice still low and hoarse. 
She felt her eyes widen with surprise. Aren't you coming as well? He shook his head and said in an oddly flat voice, you won't freeze. It's May, after all. Well, yes, but. She let her words trail off, since she didn't really know what to say. She supposed she'd been hoping, he'd interrupt her. She turned to walk up the hill, then stopped when she heard his voice, quiet and intent, behind her. I need to think, he said. About what? She shouldn't have asked, shouldn't have intruded, but she'd never been able to mind her own business, I don't know. He shrugged, helplessly. Everything, I suppose. Eloise nodded and continued back to the house. But the bleak look in his eyes haunted her all day. Chapter 9 We all miss father, especially this time of year. But think how lucky you were to have had 18 years with him. I remember so little, and I do wish he could have known me, and all that I've grown up to be. From Elise Bridgerton to her brother Viscount Bridgerton upon the occasion of the tenth anniversary of their father's death. Eloise was purposefully late for supper that evening. Not by much, it was not in her nature to be tardy, especially since it was a trait she didn't care to tolerate in others. But after the events of that afternoon, she had no idea if Sir Philip was even going to show up for supper, and she couldn't bear the thought of waiting in the drawing room, trying not to twiddle her thumbs as she wondered if she was to dine alone. At precisely ten minutes past seven, she reckoned she could assume that if he wasn't waiting for her, he wasn't joining her, and she could then proceed to the dining room on her own and act as if she'd planned to eat by herself all the while. But much to her surprise, and, if she was honest, her great relief as well, Philip was standing by the window when she entered the drawing room, elegantly dressed in evening kit that was, if not the very latest in style, obviously well made and tailored to perfection. Eloise noticed that his attire was strictly black and white, and she wondered if he was still in partial mourning for Marina, or if perhaps that was simply his preference. Her brothers rarely wore the peacock colors that were so popular among a certain set of the ton, and Sir Philip didn't seem the type either. Eloise stood in the doorway for a moment, staring at his profile, wondering if he'd even seen her. And then he turned, murmured her name, and crossed the room. I hope you will accept my apologies for this afternoon, he said, and although his voice was reserved, she could see the entreaty in his eyes, sense that her forgiveness was very much desired. No apology is necessary, she said quickly, and it was the truth, she supposed. How could she know if he should apologize when she didn't even understand what had transpired? It is, he said haltingly. I overreacted. I. She said nothing, just watched his face as he cleared his throat. He opened his mouth, but it was several seconds before he said, Marina nearly drowned in that lake. Eloise gasped, not realizing that her hand had flown up to cover her mouth until she felt her fingers on her lips. She wasn't a strong swimmer, he explained. I'm so sorry, she whispered. Were you how to ask it without appearing morbidly curious? There was no way to avoid it, and she couldn't help herself, she had to know. Were you there? He nodded grimly. I pulled her out, how lucky for her, Eloise murmured. She must have been terrified. Philip said nothing. He didn't even nod. She thought about her father, thought about how helpless she had felt when he'd collapsed to the ground in front of her. Even as a child, she'd been the sort who needed to do things. She'd never been one of life's observers, she'd always wanted to take action, to fix things, to fix people, even. And the one time it had all truly mattered, she'd been impotent. I'm glad you were able to save her, she murmured, it would have been horrible for you if you hadn't. He looked at her oddly, and she realized how strange her words had been, so she added, it's very difficult, when someone dies, and you can only watch, and you can't do anything to stop it. And then, because the moment seemed to call for it, and she felt oddly connected to this man standing so quiet and stiff in front of her, she said softly, and perhaps a bit mournfully as well, I know. He looked up at her, the question clearly in his eyes. My father, she said simply, it wasn't something she shared with many people, 
In fact, her good friend Penelope was probably the only person outside her immediate family who knew that Eloise had been the sole witness to her father's strange and untimely death. I'm sorry, he murmured. Yes, she said wistfully, so am I. And then he said the oddest thing. I didn't know my children could swim. It was so unexpected, such a complete non sequitur, that it was all she could do to blink and say, I beg your pardon? He held out his ARM to lead her to the dining room. I didn't know they could swim, he repeated, his voice bleak. I don't even know who taught them. Does it matter? Eloise asked softly. It does, he said bitterly, because I should have done so. It was difficult to look at his face. She couldn't recall ever seeing a man so pained, and yet in an odd way, it warmed her heart. Anyone who cared so much for his children even if he didn't quite know how to act around them well, he had to be a good man. Eloise knew that she tended to see the world in blacks and whites, that she sometimes leapt to judgment because she didn't stop to analyze the gradations of gray, but of this she was certain. Sir Philip Crane was a good man. He might not be perfect, but he was good, and his heart was true. Well, she said briskly, since that was her manner and she preferred to deal with problems by charging ahead and fixing them rather than stopping to lament, there's nothing to be done about it now. They can't very well unlearn what they already know. He stopped, looked at her. You're right, of course. And then, more softly, but no matter who did the teaching, I should have known they were able. Eloise agreed with him, but he was so obviously distressed, a scolding seemed inappropriate, not to mention unfeeling. You still have time, you know, she said softly. What, he said, his mocking tone turned upon himself, to teach them the backstroke so that they might expand their repertoire? Well, yes, she said, her tone slightly sharp, since she'd never had much patience for self-pity, but also to learn other things about them. They're charming children, he looked at her dubiously. She cleared her throat. They do misbehave on occasion. One of his brows shot up. Very well, they misbehave quite often, but truly, all they want is a little attention from you. They told you this? Of course not, she said, smiling at his naivete. They're only eight. They're not going to say it in so many words. But it's quite clear to me. They reached the dining room, so Eloise took the seat held out for her by a footman. Philip sat across from her, put his hand on his wine glass, men drew it back. His lips moved, but very slightly, as if he had something to say, but wasn't quite certain how to phrase it. Finally, after Eloise had taken a sip of her own wine, he asked, did they enjoy it? Swimming, I mean. She smiled. Very much. You should take them. He closed his eyes and held them that way, not for very long, but still, more than a blink. I don't think I'd be able, he said. She nodded. She knew the power of memories. Perhaps somewhere else, she suggested. Surely there must be another lake nearby. Or even a mere pond. He waited for her to pick up her spoon, then dipped his own in his soup. That's a fine idea. I think. He stopped, cleared his throat. I think I could do that. I shall ponder where we might go. There was something so heartbreaking about his expression, the uncertainty, the vulnerability, the awareness that even though he wasn't sure he was doing the right thing, he was going to try to do it anyway. Eloise felt her heart lurch, skip a beat, even, and she wanted to reach across the table and touch his hand. But of course she couldn't, even if the table weren't a foot longer than the length of her arm, she couldn't. So in the end, she just smiled and hoped that her manner was reassuring. Philip ate a bit of his soup, then dabbed at his mouth with his napkin, and said, I hope that you will join us. Of course, Eloise said, delighted. I would be desolate if I weren't invited. I'm quite certain you overstate, he said with a wry twist to his lips, but nonetheless, we would be honored, and to be quite honest, I would be relieved to have you there. At her curious expression, he added, the outing is certain to be a successful one with your presence. I'm sure you. He stopped her mid-sentence. We will all enjoy ourselves much better with your accompaniment, he said quite emphatically, 
and Eloise decided to stop arguing and graciously accept the compliment. He was, in all likelihood, correct. He and his children were so unused to spending time together that they would probably benefit from having Eloise along to smooth the way. Eloise found she didn't mind the idea one bit. Perhaps tomorrow, she suggested, if the fine weather holds out. I think it will, Philip said conversationally. The air didn't feel changeable. Eloise glanced at him as she sipped her soup, a chicken broth with bits of vegetables that needed a touch more salt. Do you predict the weather, then, she asked, quite certain her skepticism showed on her face. She had a cousin who was convinced he could predict the weather, and every time she listened to him, she ended up soaked to the skin or freezing her toes off. Not at all, he replied, but one can, he stopped, craned his neck a bit, what was that? What was what? Eloise answered, but as the words left her lips, she heard what Philip must have heard. Argumentative voices, growing louder by the second. Heavy footfall, a forceful stream of invective was followed by a yelp of terror that could only have come from the butler. And then Eloise knew. Oh, dear God, she said, her grip on her spoon growing slack until the soup dribbled off, splashing back into her bowl. What the devil? Philip asked, standing up, obviously preparing to defend his home against invasion, except that he had no idea what sort of invaders he was about to face. What sort of annoying, meddlesome, and diabolical invaders he was going to have to meet in, oh, approximately ten seconds. But Eloise did. And she knew that annoying, meddlesome, and diabolical meant nothing compared to furious, unreasonable, and downright large when it came to Philip's imminent safety. Eloise? Philip asked, his brows shooting up when they both heard someone bellow her name. She felt the blood drain from her body. Positively felt it, knew it had happened, even though she couldn't see it pooling about her feet. There was no way she could survive a moment such as this. No way she could make it through without killing someone, preferably someone to whom she was quite closely related. She stood, her fingers gripping the table. The footsteps, which, to be honest, sounded rather like a rabid horde, grew closer. Someone you know? Philip asked, quite mildly, for someone who was about to face his demise. She nodded, and somehow managed to eke out the words, my brothers. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. It occurred to Philip, as he was pinned up against the wall, with two sets of hands around his throat, that Eloise might have given him a bit more warning. He didn't need days, although that would have been nice, if still insufficient against the collective strength of four very large, very angry, and, from the looks of them, rather closely related men. Brothers. He should have considered that. It was probably best to avoid courting a woman with brothers. Four of them, to be precise. Four. It was a wonder he wasn't dead already. Anthony. Eloise shrieked, stop. Anthony, or at least Philip presumed he was Anthony, they hadn't exactly bothered to go through the necessary introductions, tightened his grip on Philip's neck. Benedict, Eloise pleaded, turning her attention to the largest of the lot. Be reasonable. The other one well. The other one squeezing his throat, there were two others, but they were just standing around glowering, loosened his grip slightly, to turn around and look at Eloise. Which was a huge mistake, since, in their haste to rip every limb from his body, none of them had yet looked at her long enough to see that she sported a nasty blackened eye. Which of course they would think he was responsible for. Benedict let out an unholy growl and jammed Philip against the wall so tightly that his feet came off the ground. Wonderful, Philip thought. Now I really am going to die. The first squeeze was merely uncomfortable, but this. Stop. Eloise yelled, hurling herself onto Benedict's back and yanking his hair. Benedict held as his head jerked backward, but unfortunately Anthony's strangulatory grip held firm, even as Benedict was forced to let go to fight off Eloise. Who was, Philip noted as well as he could, given his lack of oxygen fighting like a fury, crossed with a banshee, crossed with Medusa herself. Her right hand was still pulling out Benedict's hair, even as her left arm wrapped around his throat, with her forearm lodged quite neatly up under his chin. 
Good Christ, Benedict cursed, whirling around as he tried to dislodge his sister. Someone get her off of me. Not surprisingly, none of the other Bridgertons rushed to his aid. In fact, the one back against the wall looked rather amused by the whole thing. Philip's vision began to curl and turn black at the edges, but he couldn't help but admire Eloise's fortitude. It was a rare woman who knew how to fight to win. Anthony's face suddenly appeared very close to his. Did, you, hit her? he growled. As if he could speak, Philip thought woozily. No. Eloise cried out, momentarily taking her attention off tearing Benedict's hair out. Of course he didn't hit me. Anthony looked over at her with a sharp expression as she resumed pummeling Benedict. There's no of course about it. It was an accident, she insisted. He had nothing to do with it. And then, when none of her brothers made any indication that they believed her, she added, Oh, for heaven's sake. Do you really think that I would defend someone who'd struck me? That seemed to do the trick, and Anthony abruptly let go of Philip, who promptly sagged to the floor, gasping for breath. Four of them. Had she told him she had four brothers? Surely not, he would never have considered marriage to a woman with four brothers. Only a fool would shackle himself to such a family. What did you do to him? Eloise demanded, jumping off Benedict and hurrying to Philip's side. What did he do to you, one of the other brothers, demanded, the one who, Philip realized, had punched him in the chin right before the others had decided to strangle him instead. She shot him a scathing look. What are you doing here? Protecting my sister's honor, he shot back. As if I need protection from you. You're not even twenty, ah, uh, thought Philip, he must be the one whose name began with G. George. No, that wasn't right. Gavin? No. I'm twenty-three, the young one bit off, with all the irritability of a younger sibling. And I'm twenty-eight, she snapped. I didn't need your help when you were in nappies, and I don't need it now. Gregory. That's right. Gregory. She'd said as much in one of her letters. Ah, damn. If he knew that, then he must have known about the flock of brothers. He really had no one to blame but himself. He wanted to come along, said the one in the corner, the only one who hadn't yet tried to kill Philip. Philip decided he liked this one best, especially when he wrapped his hand around Gregory's forearm to prevent the younger man from launching himself at Eloise. Which, Philip thought, feeling rather ironically minded there on the floor, was nothing more than she deserved. Nappies, indeed. Well, you should have stopped him, Eloise said, oblivious to Philip's mental defection. Do you have any idea how mortifying? This is? Her brother stared at her, quite rightly, in Philip's opinion, as if she'd gone mad. You lost the right, Anthony bit off, to feel mortified, embarrassed, chagrined, or in fact any emotion other than blindingly stupid when you ran off without a word. Eloise looked a bit mollified, but still muttered. It's not as if I would listen to anything he has to say. As opposed to us, the one who had to be Colin murmured, with whom you are the soul of meekness and obeisance. Oh, for the love of God, Eloise said under her breath, sounding rather fetchingly unladylike, to Philip's stinging ears. Stinging? Had someone boxed his ears? It was difficult to recall. Four to one odds against did tend to muddle one's memory. You, snapped the one Philip was almost certain was Anthony, with a finger jabbed in Philip's direction, don't go anywhere. As if that were even worth contemplating. And you, Anthony said to Eloise, his voice even deadlier, although Philip wouldn't have thought it possible, what the hell did you think you were doing? Eloise tried to sidestep the question with one of her own. What are you doing here? And succeeded, because her brother actually answered her. Saving you from ruin, he yelled. For the love of God, Eloise, do you have any idea how worried we've been? And here, I thought you hadn't even noticed my departure, she tried to joke. Eloise, he said, mother is beside herself. That sobered her in an instant. Oh, no, she whispered. I didn't think. No, you didn't. Anthony replied, his stern tone exactly what one would expect from a man who'd been the head of his family for twenty years. 
I ought to take a whip to you. Philip started to intervene, because, really, he couldn't countenance a whipping, but then Anthony added, or at the very least, a muzzle, and Philip decided that brother knew sister very well, indeed. Where do you think you're going, demanded Benedict, and Philip realized that he must have started to stand before plopping back to his rather impotent position on the floor. Philip looked to Eloise, perhaps introductions are in order? Oh, Eloise said, gulping. Yes, of course. These are my brothers. I'd gathered, he said, his voice as dry as dust. She shot him an apologetic look, which, Philip thought, was really the least she could do after nearly getting him tortured and killed, then turned to her brothers and motioned to each in turn, saying, Anthony, Benedict, Colin, Gregory. These three, she added, motioning to A, B, and C, are my elders. This one and she waved dismissively at Gregory is an infant. Gregory looked near ready to throttle her, which suited Philip just fine, since it deflected the murderous intentions off of him. And then Eloise finally turned back to Philip and said to her brothers, Sir Philip Crane, but I expect you know that already. You left a letter in your desk, said Colin. Eloise closed her eyes in agony. Philip thought he saw her lips form the words, stupid, stupid, stupid. Colin smiled grimly. You ought to be more careful in the future, should you decide to run off again? I'll remember that, Eloise shot back, but she was losing her fire. Would now be a good time to stand? Philip inquired, directing his question to no one in particular. No. It was difficult to discern which Bridgerton brother spoke the loudest. Philip remained on the floor. He didn't tend to think himself a coward, and he was, if he did say so himself, quite proficient with his fists, but hell, there were four of them. Boxer he might be. Suicidal fool, he was not. How did you get that eye? Colin asked quietly. Eloise paused before answering, it was an accident. He considered her words for a moment. Would you care to expand upon that? Eloise swallowed uncomfortably and glanced down at Philip, which he really wished she wouldn't do. It only made them, as he was coming to think of the quartet, even more convinced that he was the one responsible for her injury.